uh, uh, exam and I really wish you all all the best in your preparation still have uh, less than one month to go um, tonight is basically I just want to go through some of the essential points in each uh, rest, uh, in each short case station because I realized that a lot of times no matter how much you prepare sometimes if you you will unable to an anticipate a certain uh, possibility in the exam then you may not able to think during uh, the, the, the real exam then you may not able to do well and most of the time what we realize is usually the comm skill and also the consultation everyone tends to do quite well because uh, uh, towards the end of the day we all have been practicing a lot but the short cases are often the one that once if we are unable to get the sign then unfortunately we, 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 we can't score well or those that who get the sign but unable to uh, present well this is also another uh, points that will, will draw the candidate down um, so again I will go just rearrange the format uh, if you go strictly by station 1 to 5 station 1 will be comm skill followed by recipe 2 will be consult 3 will be cardio and neuro 4 will be comm skill and abdo and then the fifth one is actually the again the clinical consultation so I just going to uh, going using this format so before we enter the exam just remember to bring the admission form and then uh, also need to be signed on the spot you can actually sign earlier but you need to present the paper when you uh, go for the exam center and then remember to bring your own stethoscope and make sure the diaphragm or the bell is, is there is functioning and then I would I would actually recommend everyone to bring your own pen torch especially uh, those with a uh, yellow light instead of the white light because uh, a lot of times although the station will provide you and then you may need to check the the patient uh, tongue and also the oral cavity when you do a short case so sometimes uh, not all station will provide and definitely short case is not expected to provide the pen torch by default unless it's a neural station so definitely uh, advise everyone to bring and then also if possible you can bring a small watch which can attach to your either your belt line or your or near the near the chest with the pocket so it's, it's also uh, easier for you to time most of the time for short cases you are only expected to time the heart rate the rest of it like respiratory rate is not really important for for patients exam but for master exam definitely because more time is given so a lot of things are more expected huh? but for patients itself uh, it's mainly uh, just to look at the patient in general and then you the way we present also is uh, quite standard I would say so I won't go through the marking skin but you all know in order to score well in the exam if possible you must score as much as you can in the short cases yeah just going to mute uh, Mute, yeah, just yeah, going to mute okay, all right. So uh, just some general advice, okay. So now with the new format, uh, the first five minutes of preparation, other than cardio and neuro, basically you all will be busy preparing the uh, the communication skill as well as the scenario. But uh, bear in mind that before you examine the patient, just uh, take a deep breath. Only then you do what is necessary, like what you have been practicing. Remember to greet both examiner and the patient and then you must show that you are not stressed although you definitely is in a very uh, stressful situation. So just, just smile to them and then focus on the patient, focus on yourself and the exam. Remember that when you walk into the uh, scenario, make sure you look at the bedside. Sometimes they put the stamp on the, on the table or sometimes they, they attach it on the wall. Look at the stem and then sometimes the stem can tell you some clues for example what's the chief complaint uh, what are the things to examine okay and then other than other than that just go by the usual flow you wash your hand introduce position expose and then check the surrounding and then remember to ask for the pain and then always remember that when you have time to practice you try to finish things uh, the, the whole examination by five to six minutes and then you also take an opportunity after you finish examination to cover back the patient exposed area and then you also need to you can actually say thanks to the patient or you can you can just smile at the patient and then wash your hand and say thank you then you face the examiner and don't look at the patient anymore just really focusing on the patient uh really focusing on the examiner eye maintain a good eye contact okay and then you may at this point of time before examiner asks you question you can actually offer to complete examination by performing a certain uh certain uh examination Okay, for the base side. 
So I just go straight to the recipe. So um, this is just some general rules that I always uh, share uh, in the previous uh, campfire session as well. So sometimes we have, when look at the patient, the inspection actually important. For example, the peripheral screening in the recipe station, you want to stand at the end of the bed, look at the patient, and you can actually offer the uh, offer to ask the patient to cough. So those that have very chesty cough, they will tell you, tells you that maybe you are dealing with bronchiectasis. And then at the same time, those that have uh, some uh, joint deformity can possibly, uh, due to rheumatoid arthritis, for example, it can, it can actually suggest fibrosis. But bear in mind that rheumatoid arthritis have five different types of manifestation of the lung, not necessarily fibrosis. It can also be bronchiectasis, okay? bronchiolitis, obliterans. It can also be bureau effusion because of the pyritis and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, this is just to give us some clue. And then if the patient looks very, uh, I would say very thin, uh, with a lot of muscle wasting, that will give, give you a hint that maybe patient have a previous uh, tuberculous infection or cancer. And then sometimes if you see any fentanyl patch over the body, that will give a strong clue towards uh, lung malignancy in particular. And then let's say you see some tattoos, uh, some injection marks, um, that you are suspicious of possibility of uh, high risk behavior, then tuberculosis is definitely one of your differential that you might think of. And then also when you look at the patient, also look at the face, look at the patient uh, body build, whether the patient is like, for example, very tall, thin, and the hands and the fingers are also quite long. So you may want to suspect, can this be some form of Marfan syndrome? Okay. And don't miss a trachea in recipe station because it's one of the, I would say, the very important uh, examination uh, under the physical examination component. You must actually try to elicit that whether your trachea is central or deviated. And then when you press the trachea, don't, don't press too harsh. Sometimes a lot of, a lot of candidates will really uh, feel the trachea very, very uh, strongly. They just press and then, and then they, they actually go quite deep. So actually trachea duration, you just need to feel at the side of the trachea. Okay, but you can actually use your middle or second uh, or index finger to follow through from the up to bottom of it. And then at the sternal edge, you just feel the side, whether you can slot in one finger a bit or you can slot in more than one finger. That will already tell you that whether the trachea is actually deviated or not. So in recipe station, it's advisable to actually complete both anterior and posterior chest. The reason is being because most of the finding can be in posterior chest, but sometimes certain finding, like for example, lung collapse, upper lobe lung collapse in particular, is actually better to be escalated and appreciated in terms of the bronchial breathing at the anterior upper chest. So the thing, the, the, the clue is actually, if you time yourself well, you should be able to examine the inspection, peripheral examination, including anterior chest by two minutes. And then you can spend the rest of the four minutes uh, more at the posterior chest, followed by the lymph node examination, pedal edema, to, to assess for that, and then you, you complete the examination. So another thing is that certain diagnosis, which is a bit extreme, will not come out in exam. For example, massive period effusion or pneumothorax, because those are the patient, those are uh, the patients that examiner will be very reluctant to recruit for exam because can can collapse, uh, not stable enough, not safe for patient. And whenever you encounter any patient with a lot of mixing of sign, can have collapse, can have consolidation, can have crepitation, can also have bronchial breathing, you may want to think of TB first because TB can manifest in the various uh, types and also there's combination of sign. So whenever you approach, uh, as you examine the patient, you tell yourself that whether that is a symmetrical chest expansion or asymmetrical chest expansion. The second clue is actually whether that you, there's any scar that you can see. When the breast, uh, when the chest expansion is equal, and then uh, but there's no scar, then you may want to think about bronchiectasis, fibrosis, and the obstructive airway disease. Basically, it's either restrictive airway or obstructive airway disease. When there is a symmetrical chest expansion, but there is a scar, so you need to think hard for a few things. Let's say there's a lateral thoracotomy scar with a symmetrical chest expansion, and then you expect the trachea to be central as well. So most of the time you may be dealing with bullectomy, uh, middle or, or lower lobectomy, and then sometimes can be unilateral lung transplant. Bilateral usually will have a either cramp shell incision or bilateral thoracotomy scar. And then sometimes can even have pyrectomy decortication. These are the few differential diagnoses that you should be running in the mind. If the chest expansion is asymmetrical uh, or the trachea is deviated, then, but there's no scar, then you need to think of collapse consolidation, uh, period effusion, or even tractional bronchiectasis or fibrosis. 
let's say the chest expansion is asymmetrical but there is a scar then it can be upper lobectomy or pneumonectomy can be recurrent period fusion with the multiple chest uh, during scar and can, can be also uh, lung volume reduction surgery which is uh, usually indicated in the advanced case of uh, COPD so recipe basically if you want to uh, categorize it in a short case it's actually quite expected a lot of time recipe station they are very expected in the sense that they usually go by these four domains like I always say it can be a scenario with a very noisy kind of scenario that is a crepitation uh, with or without clubbing uh, second scenario will be a breast sound reduce one side okay and then third one is it's just a scar station and then the fourth one can be like normal looking kind of station so when you're dealing with capitation basically essentially you want to differentiate between bronchiectasis and fibrosis when you're dealing with breast sound uh, only one side is reduced the rest is normal then you want to think hard whether there's spill effusion whether this is collapse consolidation and i also want everyone to think about an additional two things that's possible which is can be elevated hemidiaphragm especially in the case of previous trauma to the chest or any like motor vehicle accident in the past and it can also be period thickening or fibrothorax okay these are the four possibilities when you think of reduced breast sound at one side of the lung the scar is basically just lateral thoracotomy which will suggest low back or pneumonic and then usually uh, another possibility is a watts incision watts scar and then the normal kind of patient you, you may want to think of obstructive airway disease like COPD or even asthma and sometimes you may also want to reconsider your diagnosis whether your uh, sign is correct or not because you may be missing certain signs for example collapse uh, you are able to appreciate that trachea is actually deviated instead of central then you present everything as normal okay so crepitation just a quick run when you talk about crepitation you're talking about try to differentiate between bronchac and fibrosis so when you ask first uh, standing at the end of the bed you ask patient to cough you should be able to tell that whether the cough is chesty or not whether it's wet and whether it's copious amount and then uh, clubbing some definitely both can present as clubbing but sometimes clubbing to me is actually not very uh, uh, hard sign because sometimes the clubbing can be just very mild kind of clubbing okay and scar with or without scar uh, it may suggest previous intervention to the lung which also suggests that this patient may have a very severe form of disease manifestation in the past and then whether there's any trachea deviation like I said this all these are actually non-specific for both chest expansion can be reduced both sides okay and then percussion basically they are just down but it's the crepitation and any inspiration that really give a clue whether you're dealing with bronchac or fibrosis so if you're talking about bronchiectasis then you expect cause crepitation which alter with coughing so alter with coughing a lot of people think that uh, must alter a lot as in cough a while cannot hear the crepitation or initially you can hear the cause crap but after, after you ask the patient to cough there's no more cause crap so this is actually not true what we mean by outer with coughing is actually the characteristic of the cough can change or the, the loudness itself, the amplitude of the cough can change because of the mucosal uh, occurrence by coughing. So as long as you do as long as you think that the cough is actually altered, can alter the sound of the of the crepitation, it's actually considered alteration. Uh, but bear in mind that a lot of times uh, advanced fibrosis patient can also develop bronchiectasis. So and a lot of times patients with uh, bronchiectasis can also have concomitant fibrosis that's very common when you see the CT scan but clinically you should be able to tell yourself which one is predominant which one is actually uh, the main one okay so you, you you want to differentiate that and pulmonary fibrosis usually the Krebs is classically fine well cool right and it's caused in the in the late phase uh, like I mentioned can be can be just same like as bronchiectasis and usually it does not alter much with cough it's just like very dry velcro like kind of uh, crepitation that does not alter with coughing and then the end inspiration is also something that worth to take note when you ask patient to breathe in when patient breathe out towards the end before the patient breathe in again you may want to appreciate that whether the crepitation nature actually dampens or persistently loud and and clear so let's say the the towards end inspiration is actually reduced before the uh, the next inspiration usually this suggests more to bronchiectasis as compared to uh, fibrosis pulmonary fibrosis usually they remains uh, loud and also persistent okay so these are some etiology that I won't go through but this is actually how I remember when I go for exam you don't need to know a lot of the etiology but you just need to classify yourself and when the examiner asks you what are the possible causes this is also an expected kind of possible causes that you want to 
present. You want to present with can be local, like obstructive causes, can be systemic like infective causes, immunodeficiency, autoimmune or syndromic condition. And then fibrosis, you may want to differentiate that with the, whether it's a upper lobe predominant or lower 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 zone predominant kind of fibrosis. Okay. So another thing is second scenario is the reduced breath sound. So reduced breath sound, like I mentioned, it can be just breath sound reduced one side. Okay, with or without fecal deviation. So the classical uh, patient's favorite, I would say, that will come out in exam is usually the collapse consolidation and effusion. The reason why I say that is because a lot of TB they affect upper loop, and once the TB uh, actually uh, treated, they will actually cause localized bronchiectasis, or sometimes they may cause a lung collapse, uh, what we call as TB destroyed kind of lung. So a lot of time they will cause a lot of traction, and then that actually cause lung collapse. And when the lung collapse happen, they usually have some form of tracheal deviation with a varying degree. And those are the patients when you escort it, you really can hear the bronchial breathing. So at this stage, when you go before you go for exam, you must really know how to appreciate bronchial breathing. Because if you can't appreciate bronchial breathing, going for exam is a bit dangerous because you don't know whether this is normal breath sound or this is a bronchial breathing. So bronchial breathing is classically as opposed to vascular breath sound. When you inspire, when patient inspire and expire, there's usually a pause in between, and then the amplitude during the expiration will be almost same as the inspiration. While in the vascular breath sound, it will be actually loud in inspiration, and then during the expiration, it will be short, okay? And that is actually continuous within each other. But for bronchial breathing, you will hear like hollow kind of sound, like that. That means you breathe in, breathe out, also almost the same intensity, and it's actually like a as if you are tube, as in you are blowing the wind against a hollow tube like that. This is kind of the bronchial breathing sound that you need to appreciate. So how to differentiate between these two? Because a lot of times when I've been asked what are the possible differential diagnosis, for example, collapse consolidation based on the sign, of course, uh, you have to differentiate that whether this is uh, possibility or any uh, possibility of elevated hemidiaphragm or periodic thickening. But if an examiner asks you about the differential diagnosis to cause the collapse consolidation, that is means etiology. Okay, so sometimes you have to listen properly to what examiner asks in particular. So to differentiate this for basically, um, you can see that scar is not obvious. Trigger deviation will tell you because peer effusion, if it's recurrent peer effusion or even like those patients with empyema thoracis, usually they will have some. Uh, scar and also some manipulation done before okay so sometimes the trachea can be central or can be deviated to the contour lateral in a patient with moderate effusion collapse consolidation tends to have a east lateral uh, trachea deviation chest expansion can be re reduced for all condition percussion is generally dull as well and then when you listen to breath sound the only uh, standout point for the collapse consolidation is a bronchial breathing the rest is just reduced breath sound with or without any things like for example crepitation and then vocal resonance basically is also another telltale sign because in the uh, collapse consolidation, you expect the vocal resonance to increase. And because of this finding of increased vocal resonance, a lot of times, and also bronchial breathing, which can be loud, a lot of times people may misinterpret the abnormal side of the lung to be the normal side. Then they will present the abnormal side at the control lateral normal side. So this is what usually happen. So you need to, so before, to avoid this uh, from happening, before you even touch the patient, right, before you put both of your hands to feel for the chest expansion, always try to have a habit of asking patient to breathe in, breathe out about two times first, look at the chest expansion without you putting your hand, okay? Because when you put in your hand, uh, you know, uh, to, to feel for the both side, whether which expansion is reduced or not, you are mainly looking at your hand, no longer looking at the patient chest, chest wall. So, but if you're not looking at the your your own hand, you look at the patient chest wall itself, the inspiration, expiration. Most of the time, you can actually see which which side is actually more reduced. Okay, to me, the, the inspection alone is actually more sensitive than our own hand, because in exam we tend to uh, hold the patient uh, chest uh, with a different varying type of force, and that can affect your your sensation as well. Okay, so uh, my advice is to try to differentiate which side is abnormal first, and then you listen, and then you try to differentiate. If you can appreciate this bronchial breathing, then you know definitely this side is abnormal. But you think that this is normal, then you need to think hard again. When you encounter one side is normal, one side is louder than the other, you need to tell yourself which one is the abnormal side. Okay, so the next thing is actually different pathology in terms of the uh, uh, the causes of this reduced breath sound. For example, pure effusion. Usually, clinically, you can differentiate as a infective like pneumonic effusion or TB bureau 
or mitotic lesion of the lung causing malignant effusion, autoimmune condition, or even rare causes. And then pyrrhotic thickening, not common to come on the exam, but sometimes it's something that you want to consider about if the examiner asks you. Can be pyrrhotic malignancy, pyrrhotic infection, for example. And then collapse consolidation, basically, you're talking about infection, very common. This, this kind of like very examiner will definitely like to find this kind of scenario for exam as well because they are stable and then the sign is obvious and definitely this is one of the stations that you need to score if let's say you encounter any collapse consolidation so you want to offer the differential diagnosis of like uh, infection like my uh, like TB, cavitating pneumonia or even lung abscess mitotic lesion of the lung like malignancy, lymphoma ischemic condition like pulmonary infarct because consolidation can also cause uh, uh, I mean, one of the causes of consolidation can be infarct as well. And then other thing like, for example, extrinsic or foreign body aspiration, that, that one is actually not common. Huh? And then elevated diaphragm can be traumatic or atraumatic, can be due to fatty nerve injury or diaphragmatic eventuation or some form of congenital lung disease or even like diaphragmatic hernia. Okay, those are rare, but something that you need to think about when actually you feel all the signs normal. Okay, so the third possibility is the scar. Like I always say, most of the time, they may or may not have multiple uh, chest, uh, tube, chest drainage kind of scar. And then V for without any lateral thoracotomy scar or can be what surgery. So when you offer the dif differential for the scar, you should either, the, the systematic way to go about it is actually you offer from the smallest possibility to the largest possibility. So let's say you are talking about what incision because of anatomical difficulty, so they want to do what. So talking about the smallest way is actually your biopsy the lung tissue, which is sometimes is a lung nodule, suspicious lung nodule. So it can be just lung biopsy. And then can also be a rich resection because of the suspicious uh, solitary palm, uh, lung nodule, or it can be a very early stage of non, uh, small cell lung carcinoma. Or larger, increasing diameter, then you are talking about can be decortication in terms of the lung abscess, or even in, in COPD can be bullectomy, or in the case of uh, uh, Marfan syndrome, you want to remove the bullae. And then it can also be lobectomy as well as pyrectomy. Pyrectomy is very rare, basically. Basically, the lobectomy is still one of the, I would say, uh, common differential. Okay. When you encounter unilateral thoracotomy, the two common differential that you must mention is a lobectomy and pneumonectomy. So this is a must to mention. Of course, you can also start with a small uh, possibility like decortication, bullectomy. And then the, the other one are a bit rare, like lung volume reduction, things like that, which I don't usually mention. And then biotical thoracotomy, you need to think about clamshell, which is a lung transplant. The rest of the uh, the rest of the bottom three is actually very rare. Those are the surgery that usually do for the OTB patient. But I believe that we won't encounter any any kind of scar in the exam. Okay. And when you encounter a normal respiratory examination, think hard that whether this is very really normal examination with possibility of obstructive lung disease like COPD or asthma which just showing a sign of hyperinflation okay and sometimes they may not even have wrong chi because no exacerbation or anything so it's just normal and then sometimes you may think not whether you are dealing with a collapse that you miss or consolidation case that you miss the bronchial breathing or the vocal resonance and then it can also be a scar that you miss okay because like for example imagine the lung transplant patient they undergone uh, lung transplant in other center for example in other countries suddenly come to malaysia and then suddenly being recruited for exam it can happen and then uh, so sometimes if you don't check the chest for example a female patient you don't uh, see the breast uh, tissue at the, at the inframary region you may actually miss a scar and probably that's the only sign because most of the time don't have any uh, other sign okay so sometimes it may be seem normal but it may not be so normal okay there must be some as a uh, sign that the examiner calibrated so the complete examination, these are the things that you must remember to complete your examination by doing all this, okay? Observation chart, pick flow, sputum pot, and targeted examination. You can also ask relevant history, okay? So investigation and management I won't go through, but basically these are the things that you must mention. Uh, I, I like to do it in a way that I want to confirm my diagnosis and stage the severity by doing what is still a mentioning about I want to take IPC, CRP, uh, full blood count, things like that, which actually not very helpful because you know that uh, in a short case, we only got two minutes. Actually, it's three minutes. In a way, it's a three minutes to actually excluding the presentation of your finding. You only have about one minute, one to two minutes to actually discuss about your investigation and also management. So if you time yourself one minute for investigation, 
is definitely not enough if you mention as such. So you want to only mention the important thing according to the priority. So for example, you want to mention about ABG, lung function test, x-ray, HRCT, thorax first, instead of like fluber count to look for infection and stuff. Definitely you can mention that, probably not immediate. I will definitely mention if I want to look for like for example causes or complications, I will mention that I want to take a sputum culture, uh, acid fat bacilli, MTB culture, echo, or even like CCT, CCT or even PET CT to look for malignancy, or even like things like screening of the connective tissue disease, like bronchiectasis, serum ACE, IgE, and all those things. Okay, so management you can also divide. If you have, if you are a bit stuck when you think what to mention first, you can always mention that management will be multidisciplinary team approach, focusing on patient education and counseling. So with that, you already spend like six seconds. Then only you talk about, for example, want to talk about non pharmaco uh, or even uh, supportive like uh, smoking cessation, pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, oxygen therapy, dietitian, vaccination and stuff. Because like, dietitian is also something important to mention because uh, in bronchiectasis or fi pulmonary fibrosis patient, they are very deconditioned. They have a lot of malnutrition going on. That's why it's also important to boost the nutrition. And then pharmacologically, you're talking about depending on the underlying disease, whether you want to give some mucolytics, bronchodilators, antibiotics in the, for the purpose of infection or the, for, for the purpose of anti-inflammatory response in the case of bronchiectasis, steroid for exacerbation in the inflammatory subtype or considered antifibrotic, things like perfenidone or nintantinib in the case of uh, ILD, which is a fibrotic subtype. Okay, and then you may want to talk about specific or definitive kind of uh, management like targeted therapy, chemo radiotherapy in the case of lung cancer, cystic fibrosis is very rare in Malaysia, but in the Middle East or even in the Western country it can be very common. It's just as common as TB in our population. So you might mention things like CFTR modulators and then surgery, for example, in those patients with suspected lung cancer and lung transplant is always mentioned, although it's not widely practiced depending on the country, but you can always mention in the patient with advanced lung disease may actually go through lung transplant. And mentioning lung transplant itself also, you need to know a bit more. What are the criteria for a patient to be a candidate for lung transplant? Okay, there's certain criteria to it. Okay, and then another thing is that uh, advanced care planning in a patient with those uh, late stages. Okay, so next I will go to cardio. Cardio is basically, I want to make it simple for tonight's session try not to make it heavy because if you all watch my YouTube uh, videos that I uploaded, we actually talk in detail about all this, uh, each, each system very detailed. So, but tonight's session is mainly touch and go, but uh, focus on the important salient things. So cardio, I always like to divide into a WAF, either it's a native WAF or mechanical WAF, and then the next thing is a congenital heart, okay? It is very, very unlikely that they will give a normal cardiovascular examination. Okay, because cardio definitely will have sign. Most of the time, must have sign, even if it's just a scar. So you must think hard that when your cardiology station, when you cannot appreciate any sign, there must be something wrong. You must be missing out a lot. Uh, some of the uh, subtle sign that the examiner has calibrated. Okay, so but to me, out of these three possibility, the native valve is usually the hardest as compared to the mechanical valve. Mechanical valve will be the easiest in my opinion. And then second will be congenital heart. Third will be the WAF. The way I reason it is because uh, WAF sometimes you have different dif uh, difficult to actually differentiate the pathology well. Because cardio, if you cannot get the diagnosis correct, definitely your marks will be uh, minus by half. You definitely will kind of like fail the cardio station. Okay, so especially for mechanical WAF also, although I say it's the easiest out of these three, if you miss a single, uh, if you miss a dual valve, it's still you present a single valve. Or if it's a single valve, you present as a dual valve. Definitely, you will miss the station as well. You will you will fail that station, because it really go by the heart sign. Cardio is always about the heart sign. So tell yourself that a lot of times, a lot of people will tell that cardio is the hardest station out of the four. But I would I would actually think that this four station, if you practice well, they are actually very expectable and, and we actually if we anticipate well and we we know our sign we can appreciate the sign actually the four station is actually doable and you can even score perfect for each one okay i score i actually score almost all perfect except the new row because not enough time to elicit one of the sign but basically the, the point is that if you if you practice enough and you know the the possibility that can come out in each station you should be able to do well okay so congenital heart if you're thinking of things like asd vsd pda 
and then the common one is a club and cyanose kind of patient like in a corrected TOF or even any form of cyanotic congenital heart versus isomangial syndrome and don't ever forget that there's always the entity of dextrocardia the moment you cannot feel the apex bit you don't try to just do a showmanship you can actually ask patient to turn to the left lateral position to feel for the apex if you cannot please be remember to feel the apex at the right side to show that you actually look hard for it okay so some of the useful clue that i think personally for cardio system is the inspection and also palpation in a way so when you see the patient in the hole you want to tell yourself that whether the patient is young or the patient is like middle age to elderly because young patient definitely you're thinking heart more to valvular or congenital heart middle elderly can be valvular but most of the time it's still predominantly valvular or even like mechanical right or native and then next thing is uh, especially for young patient or even the middle age you want to see whether there's any syndromic features okay that may suggest for example down syndrome uh, turner syndrome noonan syndrome marfan syndrome there's a lot more to go on but because all these syndrome will actually give you a clue before you uh, listen to any murmur or elicit any sign you will already expected and anticipate that what are the possible uh, uh, finding that you are thinking of and then the third one is actually the scar scar is important whether patient have any midline sternotomy scar lateral thoracotomy scar so when there's a midline sternotomy scar it can be it can suggest a congenital heart repair can suggest a valvular replacement with or without cabbage okay but bear in mind that midline sternotomy may or may not have a mechanical clicks okay some patients they actually uh, only underwent valvular valve replacement but it's actually a bioprosthetic and there's no uh, saphenous harvesting scar seen and sometimes the saphenous harvesting scar nowadays we got endoscopic method instead of the usual long scar incision method so endoscopic method of the of the saphenous harvesting is just a puncture hole with a very small like as small as a skin biopsy kind of scar at the at the medial aspect of the of the shin so sometimes you may miss that a lot of time they are doing minimally invasive surgery now so they harvest the saphenous pain actually very uh, minimally invasive technique just very very faint kind of scar it can happen but sometimes if you have, there's no clicks only midline sonomy you may want to think of can this be uh, bioprosthetics uh, valve replacement as part of your differential okay another thing is that if it's a, having a lateral thoracotomy scar you need to think of congenital heart that was underwent some form of palliative shunting while awaiting for definitive surgical repair when the patient is younger age like things like BT shunt or in the cases of uh, lung pathology coexisting with the heart pathology like in the syndrome of Marfan and the, th the fourth thing is perhaps the pulse pulse is important because if you feel the pulse volume is very low then you may want to uh, think that can this patient having stenosis like mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis when the pulse volume is really good you want to think of regurgitation whether it's a uh, uh, mitral regurgitation or even aortic regurgitation and then the regularity itself also will tell you that whether you are you have dealing with any atrial fibrillation or not because with the presence of af then you will suggest more of mitral pathology uh, usually aortic they don't have much issue with the uh, uh, atrial fibrillation unless you are so so unfortunate that you may have some thyroid disorder on top of uh, uh, aortic regurgitation then you may actually have AF but this is actually not common so we go by the common uh, scenario and common kind of thinking process so the fourth the fifth thing is the apex so we should not expect uh, apex speed to be displaced in the case of stenosis unless it's a mixed valve disease but usually stenosis alone should not cause apex speed to be debated and then the uh, regurgitation should be displaced as well and then like I say always do not miss the textural cardia so the approach in cardiology, all these are really gone through. I just want to highlight the fact about the syndromic screening. Uh, there's a lot of mnemonic out there, whether or not you want to screen for it. But just bear in mind that you want to check the hand to look for the fingers and the thumb. Because let's say the thumb is actually tall, like instead of like having two phalanx, you actually have three phalanx. Then you, this will, or, or if let's say the radius is actually hypoplastic or even one of the digits is missing or even like polydactyly right you want to think of this congenital hoff oren syndrome which may associated with uh, septal defect can be ASD or VSD commonly it's still ASD but it's not common to come on exam but think these are the things that you want to screen through and then William is basically AS but usually they are like Alfin kind of faces 
Okay, muffin definitely everyone are very familiar, I believe. So very tall, high arch palette, and then got irrational dactyly flat, uh, pest trainers of it cause as fat food, can be ankylizing spondylitis when they persistently having a f uh, fixed fracture of the neck sometimes, and then, but generally if you don't if you don't check for it you will you might miss it. Okay, because they they can be very subtle as well. Noonan, uh, internal syndrome, I think. Very characteristic features. Same goes to Down syndrome. Uh, Pseudoxanthoma elasticum is actually very rare in our population. More common in the in the Western country, but generally this is something that you want to think about it. Etiology, I always like to just make it simple. Whether it's a too young, too old, or infection in between, okay. So you can talk about congenital uh, uh WAF abnormality. You can talk about calcified degenerative WAF. You can talk about infection in the, in the case of uh, previous infection like rheumatic heart disease or recent infection or active infection like in the case of infective endocarditis. And then the rest of it, if you want more, you can tamper the connective tissue uh, disorders and also autoimmune disorder. What is MOPE? It's basically Marfan syndrome, osteogenesis imperfecta, pseudoxanthoma elastica, and also allodendos. But basically, uh, it's not common, like I say. These are not the, thing, the, the first few differentials that I want to offer, especially in the case of valvular heart disease. Investigation for cardio is also very expected. Bedside ECG, checks X-ray, echocardiography, and then chronic angiogram before definitive surgery to be done. Whether you want to do a patient, uh, to subject patient for cabbage, for example. In the case of pulmonary hypertension, you may also want to offer things like right heart catheterization. So these are how I approach. Just imagine you are checking domain by domain. So, uh, if you are if you are heard a murmur at the at the uh, apex area or the mitral area, you're thinking about all this. And then if you're heard at the tricuspid area or lower left sternal edge, then you're thinking about TR, VSD, if it's pan systolic. Bear in mind that hokum can actually loudest at the left sternal edge, be the upper or lower left sternal edge. And then if it's upper left sternal edge, if it's a systolic murmur, you want to li listen hard whether there's any split second heart sound. Because if the speed heart sound is present, then you are thinking about atrial septal defect. And then uh, also remember that there's possibility to have a ejection systolic murmur to suggest hokum as well. And then if you escalate the aortic region, you hear the usually it's an ejection systolic, can be early diastolic murmur as well. So these are how we usually approach. And sometimes if you think it's continuous murmur, you may want to escalate the, the left supraclavicular region to listen for any uh, machinery or continuous murmur. Okay, so this also another thing that very common to come out. What are the indication to go for surgery, mitral valve or aortic valve replacement? So I won't go through, but basically it's just very simple. If you you can classify it whether it's a stenosis or regurgitation, mitral or aortic, and bear in mind that in a case of uh, I usually how how I divide is actually usually for a case of like regurgitation, usually we are talking more of the quant quantitative kind of parameters in the case of asymptomatic so you're talking about a lot of values you, know? you can see that I always use a rule of 50 so anything above and be below for example for mitral regurgitation I'm talking about rough replacement if the patient is symptomatic definitely is indicated if the stand patient have SOB itself and you listen that is a mitral regurgitation then definitely this is symptomatic MR already so it's indicated for mitral valve surgery let's say patient is no symptom uh, let's say it's just like palpitation, not really SOB or failure kind of symptom. So you want to tell the examiner that it can be uh, whether it's a LVEF less than 60%, uh, LVESD more than 45%, or uh, the estimated pulmonary artery pressure more than 50 Okay, For LT regurgitation, you're talking about 50, 50, 55. Again, it's almost like 50 rules, right, in a way. So LVESD less than 50, LT root diameter more than 5 cm or 5 mm or, or 50 mm. LVSD more than 55. So it's actually not hard to memorize. It's just that you you, you you just remember that regurgitation, murmur, you are basically talking about quantitative kind of uh, indication. But in the stenosis kind of uh, murmur, you're actually talking about more like qualitative symptom kind of thing or clinical kind of sign. For example, pulmonary hypertension, hemoptysis, regarding thromboembolism, despite anticoagulation. Like for example, for aortic stenosis, you kind of like a mixture of quantitative as well as qualitative but you can still mention things like qualitative like hypotension on exercise stress test ventricular tachycardia LV dysfunction and then the, the, the severe very severe type of aortic stenosis you can mention that the valve gradient less than 0 0.6 and then mean 
uh, uh, mean pressure gradient actually uh, more than 40 okay so these are like some of the expected kind of uh, question that you need to answer mixed valve i'm not going to talk much about it you all can listen to the previous recording but basically you try to differentiate which one is more predominant okay so it's not difficult to differentiate you just need to go by the apex speed and the pulse volume mainly and then you listen for any uh, hard sound in particular the s1 and also the s2 okay usually that's how we, we differentiate and then club and sinus patient very famous to come out in the exam generally they are young to middle age and they may or may not have very drumstick kind of clubbing with sinosis and then you also have a few differences that you want to differentiate them first is a scar usually isomanger syndrome should not have scar because they already failed and then by definition of isomanger you cannot do corrective surgery to repair unless you subject the patient for heart transplant which we rarely do even in, the, in this day and age okay so meaning to say that isomanger syndrome usually have no scar but let's say it has scar, it means that the repair has failed. Okay, most of the time, isomanger syndrome usually don't have scar, because it means that patient have a, uh, a asynotic uh, uh, left to right shunt that subsequently develop a reversal right to left shunt, and that actually causes uh, isomanger syndrome. And as compared to uh, TOF or other form of uh, congenital synotic heart disease like. Uh, TGA, TAPVD, for example. So they usually have a scar, definitely, and the midline as well as the lateral. And then in terms of murmur, usually for repair TOF, you may or may not get injection systolic or uh, early diastolic murmur at the uh, pulmonary region. It can suggest functional PS in the case of restenosis, or it can be su also suggest the after the repair has become loose up already so you actually you are thinking you are, it's actually becoming something like functional pulmonary regurgitation and then as opposed to isomanger usually isomanger have no murmur because by definition the shunt is reversed but bear in mind that in a lot of isomanger patients they will develop pulmonary hypertension and what are the what are the signs of the pulmonary hypertension is definitely tricuspic regurgitation so a lot of times you will listen that it's a pan-systolic murmur so, but you, you will still say that this patient can be having an isomanger syndrome because the patient have a pulmonary hypertension with a, uh, with, a, with a clinical tricuspid regurgitation, okay? So that's why your examination must be good. You must be able to elicit that this pan-systolic murmur actually accentuated with inspiration, okay? And loudest here actually at the lower left sternal edge. So again, pulmonary hypertension shouldn't occur in a TOF, with bad TOF case, but most of the time it's definitely present in isomanger syndrome. That means what you're expecting is a loud P2, loud and palpable P2, okay? So you also want to say when you want to complete examination by cardio, you want to mention all that pulmonary uh, observation chart, pulse pressure, especially whether to look for widened or narrow in the case of aortic pathology, whether patient having any fever, fundoscopy to look for raw spot or retinopathy changes, bedside during deep state, okay, ECG, and in the case of uh, mechanical WAF, I will usually do extra step. I will actually ask patient to, in fact, after examining the cardiovascular station for any mechanical, the moment I hear mechanical clicks with midline stenotomy, I will definitely end the examination before I even ask patient to, to, uh, to check for the pedal edema. I will actually ask patient to lift up the wrist and the arm to look for any pronator drift and ask patient to close the eye because I just want to see whether patient got any history of stroke. Let's say that one side is actually unable to lift up or even one side is actually drift, then you know that the patient may have a stroke. There may be a complication of thromboembolism in the case of mechanical uh, replacement, valve replacement uh, surgery. And always offer to check the INR as well, the book. Let's say you saw uh, this is a case of mechanical replacement. So when you want to present the case, so it's always safer for us to kind of like go through the usual way, but we make it more concise. I want to say that in, on inspection, uh, this is a, a middle age or young or even like uh, elderly uh, man or even lady uh, otherwise not in respiratory distress okay uh, or even require oxygen therapy okay you want to mention that there are sinus or not any clubbing or not and whether there's any stigmata or ie and then how is the pulse comment a bit on the pulse and then mention whether there's a pallor or jaundice and then uh, cardio i feel is important for us other than looking at the high arch palate when you shine your torch right you also want to look for dental hygiene as well not to comment about it because that can suggest IE, and then JVP over the neck, and then and then after that you go to precordium, you say on inspection whether there's any scar or devices seen, and then you want to comment about the apex bit and the heave, 
and then only then you, you, you say on escaltation what you found in this patient. And additionally, after the precordial, you want to say that the lungs also got fibrosal crepitation, got pitted edema, things like that. I want to check the uh, pointed to it, for example. So when you do a quick summary, you want to mention that this is my working diagnosis is what? Evidence by what? And then how is the severity, for example? And let's say the scenario outside mentioned something like sh shortness of breath or any failure kind of symptom. You want to also tamba that this patient has symptomatic severe mitral regurgitation, for example, as your complete diagnosis. And then uh, complication-wise, want to mention like any evidence of heart failure. Generally, for left heart, left sided heart failure, you are talking about bibasal crabs or even gallop rhythm. Right sided heart failure is the what that you what we usually comment. So right heart failure. So raised GVP, hepatomegaly, and foot edema. So raised GVP alone without hepatomegaly or pedal edema is like kind of like a mild form of heart failure. Hepatomegaly with a raised GVP kind of like moderate, and then you already got pedal edema is definitely already severe. Same goes to pulmonary hypertension (PHT). When you got palpable or loud P2, it's a it's a mild form of P, uh, pulmonary hypertension. If there's a palm, uh, if there is actually a parasitic heave, then this is actually moderate. And if it's a severe TR, then this is actually, a, uh, sorry, if it's there's a TR, then this is a case of severe pulmonary hypertension. Isomanger syndrome generally they are sinus, they are club, and usually they have a loud P2. Okay, may or may not have murmur. Like I say, so the comment also whether there's any AF, and then if it's a case of prostatic mechanical valve, we want to comment things like TAVI. TAVI is like a intervention for aortic stenosis that's not feasible for open repair. But I kind of like use it for a mnemonic. I want to in the case of mechanical valve replacement because I want to see whether there's there's any evidence of thromboembolism, any anemia, any valve failure in the case of regurgitation murmur. If you're talking about mitral replacement you, you shouldn't hear a mitral regurgitation like PSM in the aortic valve replacement you should not hear aortic regurgitation like in the case of uh, early diastolic murmur okay and also comment about the IE stigmata then you offer etiology and by this time of uh, before going to investigation if you haven't mentioned about complete your examination you may want to offer okay because cardio generally we have enough time these are some baseline investigation that we all expected to mention management supportive you can mention the four pillars of heart failure, let's say patient has heart failure, optimized diuresis, things like that, and then definitely surgery like surgical uh, valve replacement or implantable cardiac devices. Okay, so generally that's about it for cardio. Neuro basically is very extensive, it's impossible to cover neuro briefing in half an hour, but that, that's why I think uh, there's also a role for us to, for anyone interested, to actually listen back the previous recording about the. I, I, I remember I have just one neuro kind of session on uh, all the detailed neural examination and approaches but i just want to go through a simple approach in neuro neuro to us is time okay just like uh, in stroke is always about time so time is important neuro is uh, i learned it from the hard way as well i know I, I know that i don't have enough time to complete but i know the diagnosis is towards that side for example in my real exam so i will just do what i can i know that not enough time to elicit yeah, definitely examiner can penalize you, but if your diagnosis is correct, if your sign is correct, definitely you still get almost full marks as well. So time is important because you have, for example, you have just six minutes to actually examine upper limb, lower limb, uh, cranial nerve, extra perimeter like Parkinson or cerebellar sign, and even do some special tests to confirm the etiology. So you are very packed with just six minutes alone. So you need to choose the stem carefully, choose the domain that you want to examine carefully. So that's why the stem always will help us. So stem will tell us that whether which one you want to examine first. Let's say the stem tell you that patient got, uh, for example, patient got difficulty to open the eyes, patient got uh, things like uh, difficulty to swallow, patient have uh, for example, patient have uh, difficulty to see or even burning your vision, this kind of stem. And then, and then if the stem actually asks you to examine the cranial nerve, then definitely no, no problem. You straight away go to examine the cranial nerve. Okay, so let's say the stem, uh, and, and we have to proceed from, from there. So cranial nerve, we talk about cranial nerve, although there's a 12 cranial nerve, basically the first cranial nerve you can kind of like omit it because it won't come on the exam. And then basically you want to divide it into three domain, whether you're talking about whether there's any eye issue, which in particular is a third nerve approach, or even second nerve. Face, we're talking about seven nerve, and then with or without additional clues. And then last thing we're talking about bulba. So if you classify the cranial nerve examination to be further into these three domain, then it makes the examination easier. 
because each domain you can actually proceed based on the differential diagnosis okay Let, let's say the stem is actually examine upper limb and lower limb so you want to know that this is upper or lower motor neuron lesion and whether there's actually a uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical presentation and whether you're dealing with proximal or distal kind of weakness because this will also tell you which uh, domain to proceed next but basically you are just proceeding with tone power reflex sensation coordination okay if the patient have a spastic kind of paraparesis weakness spasticity you want to look remember to always check the neck and the back for the scar and always offer to check the eyes for every evidence of RPD, nystagmus or INO. Basically, it's not difficult. You just shine the torch and also check the vertical gaze or horizontal gaze to look for it. Because having those signs present will tell you that this can be demyelination in the case of uh, multiple sclerosis or thrombus malitis or more like what we call as a demyelination. Okay? And then facet paraparesis, you want to look hard for myopathic screening. Okay, most of the time, facet paraparesis uh, cannot be neuromuscular junction. Uh. Usually, neuromuscular junction, you should not have muscle wasting. They can be flaccid in a way, but usually, uh, they are quite strong. But the, the main idea you want to exclude facet paraparesis is actually whether there's any anterior horn cell disease first. Like motor neuron disease, you will get a very significant fasciculation. And then you may also get some mixing of upper motor neuron sign, like for example, upgoing panta response. Or even cronus and then if it's not anterior horn cell level you want to look for whether there's any peripheral neuropathy if let's say there's no stocking kind of distribution there's no sensory loss a reflexia this kind of presentation then you really need to think hard for myopathic screening so myopathic screening you want to you can start from up to bottom or you want to start from bottom to to the top so i will usually go from bottom to the top because it's easy i will look at the calf first to look for any pseudo hypertrophy of the calf which may suggest beckers or duchenne I will ask patient to squeeze my finger, my two, my index and the middle finger. Ask patient to just grip my fingers, and then to look for any and, and ask the patient to let go to look for any uh, uh, what we call as a mus uh, dystrophia myotonica, and then I will also ask patient to lift lift up the shoulder to look for any scapular winging, and then I will also look hard at the face to look for whether there's any seven nerve lower motor neuron palsy. Ask patient to just uh tell her or him about his name in full sentence so i also can see whether there's any bar palsy or you want to actually ask patient to go how do you assess a, a, a speech in exam in a quick way is actually you can ask patient to actually can you tell me uh, can you name the months from december to january then the examiner uh, <clears throat> then the patient will tell you december november october like that so it's easy for you to assess the, the speech in the long run or you can ask the patient to tell the home address, but I don't generally ask the patient to do that because I feel it's a bit uh, full of privacy to for 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 a surrogate to tell that. So uh, you can either use British Constitution, West West uh, West uh, Streets Register and all those. But to me, this is a bit UK kind of style, a Malaysian kind of style. You can either uh, ask patient to just you want to make it long and simple. You can just ask the patient to tell. Can you tell me name uh, December uh, to uh, name the months in the reverse order December to no, uh, January for me then you can just listen for the for the uh, speech and then whether patient have any rash or endocrinal stigmata that will, that will suggest uh, endocrinal or autoimmune kind of myopathy then also examine the gate so gate so let's say the stem actually asks you to uh, assess the gate then definitely you want to assess the gate but let's say the stem tell you that the patient have unsteadiness or frequent fall uh, uh, in, in at home and then please examine the patient so when you get this kind of scenario you know that gate is definitely the priority what is the difference between assessment of the gate first or examine the neural uh, lower motor neuron first the difference is that if you examine the gate <coughs> you will not miss the uh, cerebella and the parkinson gate which in which the approach is totally different imagine you examine the lower limb first for cerebellar's uh, examination or the Parkinson examination, it will be almost normal. Of course, cerebellar sign you can have upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron, just like my my case in exam as well. My case was actually lower motor neuron uh, with cerebellar sign. Of course, if you approach as such, definitely you will you will actually uh, get the idea. 
So, but you want to get the cerebellar sign first. Let's say this is a case of cerebellar syndrome. You want to get all the cerebellar sign first. There's no point you examine the lower limb first and you wasted a lot of time. And most of the time, sensation very subjective and you may spend a lot of time to, to actually try to quantify it. And therefore, a lot of times you may waste a lot of unnecessary uh, seconds, I would say. That's why if you if the stem is actually unsteadiness, fall, gait issues, examine the gait first, okay? Only then you proceed with lower limb or you proceed accordingly, okay? Uh, examine, if the stem actually sh strongly asks you to examine the lower limb first, then you should examine the lower limb and you lead the gait as part of your last assessment, okay? Because they means that the sign will be more towards the lower limb examination than the gait, okay? Then sometimes you may need to tell yourself that what is the pathology, whether it's a upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, or it's a mixed level, and what is the etiology of it? What is the anatomical etiology and what is the uh, uh, etiological uh, diagnosis? Okay. So this is some of the possibility, like if you talk about eye, you're talking about possible case of ptosis or ophthalmoplegia, talking about face, you're talking about seven nerve palsy in general, Balba, you're talking about pyramidal, extra pyramidal issue. What I mean by extra pyramidal is like Parkinson, you will have a monotonal speech. Uh, if you talk about uh, cerebellar, you will have scanning staccato kind of speech. Par pyramidal can be just uh, uh, what, what we call as, uh, this can be dysphasia, can be dysarthria as well, but generally may not be very uh, uh, suggestive. Can be so-called bauba or pseudo bauba, but generally speech will not come out isolated in exam. Generally, you will be have more hard sign to, to check for, for example, facial nerve palsy. Okay, so upper limb, lower limb approach is almost similar. You want to tell yourself whether it's a symmetrical or asymmetrical, whether it's a proximal or predominantly distal, or both proximal and distal are wasted and weak. And then you tell yourself whether this is spastic or flaccid. Okay, next is for the gait. You want to check whether it's a pyramidal or extra pyramidal. Pyramidal, what I mean is that uh, pyramidal is basically, let's say you walk the patient and then you find out that there's a hemiplegic gait. Or even, uh, for example, yeah, it's just basically hemiplegic gait in a way. Then you are thinking more to or spastic gait. That will tell you more to upper motor neuron lesion. If it's a, for example, it's a high stepage gait, or in the case of Waldring gait, then it tell you more to lower motor neuron. Extra pyramidal, you're talking about cerebellar gait, which is a taxic kind of gait, or you're talking about short shuffling, difficult turning, and block things like that, reduce arm swing in the case of Parkinsonism, okay? So gate will tell you a lot, okay? And then uh, look and proceed kind of station, some scenario can be just look and proceed. So if it's look and proceed, you really need to follow the instruction. Look first before you proceed. Because a lot of times you may miss a subtle clue. For example, if you look at the patient's face, if you didn't appreciate that the patient actually have a subtle facial asymmetry, then you may, you may want to rush into examine the lower limb or upper limb, things like that, or even walk the patient. So that's why you must actually appreciate first whether the patient got any ptosis, whether the patient got any uh, asymmetry or not. So you must look properly first before you proceed, okay? So these are just, I would say, helpful uh, dermatome, myotome, and reflexes that we want to help us to localize the lesion. I won't go too in detail. Uh, but neuro, in short, you want to complete examination by also checking the vital sign. In the case of Parkinson, you may want to check for posterior BP uh, and other things like, for example, you want to complete your full neurological examination. If you examine the cranial nerve, you want to examine the lower limb, upper limb, and also the gait, things like that. In the case of myelopathy, you want to also offer to check for, to ballot the abdomen, oh, sorry, not, not ballot the abdomen, to actually uh, palpate the abdomen to look for any palpable bladder to look for the anal tone and also the saddle anesthesia. And for fundoscopy, you want to check for papilledema, retinopathy, assess the cardiovascular risk. Even you can mention about the sugar monitor, uh, sugar bedside urine deep stick and also the sugar check finger prick. And in the case of stroke or in the case of Parkinson, you can also mention like assess a higher mental function like MMSE or MOCA. Or uh, chaotic brew is something optional. I would say it's not very necessary. And then you can also perform a full cardiovascular examination, okay? And then in the case of Parkinson, you may also want to assess the handwriting. You can also check the Archimedean uh, spiral, asking patient to do that, but generally you just mention, uh, okay? Just a showmanship kind of thing. And then when you examine, when you present the patient, you just tell the patient inspection, what have you found? And then what are the signs? And then whether it's upper or lower motor neuron, evidenced by the 
tone power reflex sensation coordination and also some additional finding so we want to tell the examiner that what is your anatomical diagnosis and what is the etiological diagnosis and then complication you can mention if you want let's say patient have a lot of bruises that may suggest frequent fall and with the scenario of frequent fall you may suggest patient have immobility that require walking aids and if the patient is on rice tube or even pack tube feeding they may suggest a feeding uh, uh, discontinuity or some dysphagia and then you need continuous patient CBD dependent in the case of for example myelopathy and then there's some these are the some important revision to go through eye face and then uh, hemiparesis or monoparesis paraparesis basically you're talking about myelopathy and uh, cerebellar sign okay parkinson motor neuron disease peripheral neuropathy mg and myopathy so we shouldn't go to exam unless we are familiar with all this uh, approach okay so cerebellar i'm just going through quickly because it's quite common to come out in exam when you encounter a cerebellar syndrome you want to tell yourself whether it's unilateral or bilateral Unilateral cerebellar syndrome can be just isolated cerebellar or can be cerebellar plus. What I mean by cerebellar plus is there may be additional sign. For example, there is also, uh, sorry, MPM. Okay, so there's also uh, cerebral pontine angle lesion. Like for example, you're talking about five, six, seven, eight kind of cranial nerve involvement. Then you may suggest a CP angle lesion. Or let's say in the case of lateral mandibular syndrome, in which there is a loss of uh sensation over the isolateral trigeminal with a contralateral spinal thalamic kind of involvement then you're talking about lateral mandibular syndrome or it can be also demyelination then most often they not only have cerebellar sign they may also have things like uh rpd positive uh, ino okay they may even have a uh, upper motor neuron lesions uh, for example that is a uh, positive uh uh, cronus or even hyperreflexia over the bilateral lower limbs or upper limb. So these are the possibility that we can encounter. So if it's a bilateral cerebellar syndrome, then you want to tell yourself that whether this is actually pyramidal or non-pyramidal. Pyramidal means to say it's all upper motor neuron. You got hyperreflexia, you got cronus, you got upgoing panda. So hereditary uh, or even so-called uh, hereditary ataxia can be autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. Autosomal dominant basically just means spinal cerebellar syndrome. Autosomal recessive ataxia is just Friedreich's ataxia or ataxic telangiectasia. Can be demyelination also in the case of MS, MMOSD. It can also be multiple systemic atrophy uh, C. Uh, generally, the uh, MSAC is rare, so you want to focus on the uh, hereditary ataxia and also demyelination in the case of bilateral cerebellar syndrome with upper motor neuron lesions. Let's say it's non pyramidal you're talking about metabolic and systemic causes so common is just like drugs for example phenotoin carbamazepine or even alcohol metabolic condition like wilson hypothyroid vitamin e deficiency and then paraneumastic cerebellar syndrome can present as a lower motor neuron lesion as well and then the rest of it is quite rare hereditary like neurofibromatosis type 2 or one hyperlindau they may have lower motor neuron cerebellar syndrome okay Parkinson, I think everyone is very familiar. Parkinson is also one of the common kind of scenario that will come out. So that's, it's important for you all to actually get familiar with how we examine Parkinson and then how we present. So Parkinson can be idiopathic, can be secondary, or can be Parkinson plus. Okay, won't go through in detail, but pharmacological, non-pharmacological, and advanced stage. So these are the all the expected things. But basically, this management is mainly for primary Parkinsonism, which is the Parkinson disease. So secondary Parkinson, Parkinson or what we call as Parkinsonian syndrome. So those have to target the etiology. If it's a drug induced, you remove the carpet drug. Wilson disease, you start patient on the copper chelating agents. Uh, vascular Parkinsonism, manage the cardiovascular risk factor. Normal pressure, hydrocephalus, you need to consider uh, shunt or even uh, lumbar puncture, things like that. But it's actually not common. Uh. Usually Parkinsonism, you just want to, they just want to test your working diagnosis and your differential diagnosis. And common question will be, what are the signs to suggest atypical Parkinsonism? Which means it's uh, those signs that is not really suggestive of idiopathic Parkinson disease. Okay, so those are the questions that can be common and how do you manage things like that. So myelopathy can be generally divided by medical or surgical causes. Medical, I like to uh, actually divide it to be, uh, we, we always use a mnemonic, something like toast, uh, sorry, fast and toast, right? But medical, the important thing is just, uh, I mean vascular, if you're talking about anterior spinal artery infarct, reversible one will be like subacute combined degen in the case of vitamin B12 deficiency. And then the rest of it is basically transverse myelitis. 
and can be demyelination or infective in nature and then can be familial or hereditary spastic paraparesis. Okay, these are the medical causes. Surgical causes can be like traumatic, disc prolapse, spinal cord injury, uh, can be osteoarthritis or spondylosis, like abscess, stringomyelia or tumor, like a toast. So this is how I used to remember, but generally you don't need to uh, memorize so much. You can just offer a few out of, out of so many differential diagnoses. Okay, lower motor neuron. So lower motor neuron is important for you to know the approach as well. So when you have a lower motor neuron lesion, for example, in the case of low limb examination, you want to actually tell yourself how do you differentiate between different levels. So before you go into exam, you must mind map yourself. You actually can do this table, but you just space out all the answer, and then you try to mind map yourself. So think in these three domains. What is the pattern of weakness for each level? And what is the reflex? And how is the sensation? So you go one by one. For example, anterior horn cell, you will be expect to have asymmetrical or unilateral kind of pattern of weakness and usually the distal is actually more towards uh, more than proximal but sometimes can be both okay and most of the time they will have severe muscle wasting and also they will have prominent fasciculation so these are the kind of motor component that you are dealing with for anterior horn cell for reflex is variable can be hyper hypo irreflexia and sensation because it's a pure motor lesion so it should be normal okay so nerve group or plexus lesion your so most of the time pattern of weakness is asymmetrical because it just affect one side of the nerve roots and then it's unilateral it can be focal also and therefore the pattern of weakness is always myotonal so because it's based on myotone that's why the myotone distribution in the earlier side is important then you know that which uh, area is affected okay and then reflex will be a reflexia or hyperreflexia at the affected roots okay and then sensation will be dermatomal okay distribution while you're talking about peripheral nerve then you're talking about symmetrical or bilateral involvement and usually the distal will be more affected than proximal except in the case of CIDP and GBS because there is already a uh, severe muscle involvement so that's why you will also get proximal more than distal but generally for peripheral neuropathy you should get distal more than proximal reflexes generally is either absent or very brief hyporeflexia like that despite gentastic maneuver okay sensation is definitely growth and stocking distribution however in a certain case of uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy like for example uh, multifocal motor neuropathy is a pure motor kind of uh, lesion it can be normal in the intact and things like pure motor peripheral neuropathy uh, for example uh, can be lead poisoning can be also like uh, uh, other thing like can be uh, GBS because GBS can be also predominantly motor and sensation can be very patchy and can be intact most of the time so sometimes you need to offer a differential analysis sensation intact does not exclude uh, sorry, sensation normal does not exclude peripheral neuropathy. Must always think about pure motor peripheral neuropathy. Okay, next thing is a neuromuscular junction. What is the pattern of weakness? It will be symmetrical, it will be bilateral, and you usually because the proximal muscle bulk is more than distal, so proximal will actually involve more than distal, and then usually they will have fatigability and they may may have eye and bulbar sign as well. Okay, and because at, at the level of neuromuscular junction, the reflex is normal and sensation is also normal okay so how about muscle pattern of weakness so muscle pattern of weakness should be symmetrical bilateral as well and then muscle most of the time because muscle bulk again more bulk at the proximal than distal so usually proximal will be weaker than distal except in the case of distal myopathies like for example inclusion body myocyt uh, myositis uh, dystrophia myotonica or even distal myopathies hereditary form of distal myopathies okay so, but generally, it's actually proximal more than distal. How about reflex? Muscle myopathy reflex usually is normal. However, because of the chronic uh, disease activity, they may be developing disuse atrophy, and therefore the the reflex can be hyporeflexia. And then muscle sensation can be must be normal. Okay, so you can see that generally, if you go by this way, let's say your sensation is normal, and that is, uh, for example, the reflex. Yeah, reflex is actually very subjective, but let's say sensation is normal, so you still have four levels to exclude, for example, anterior horn cell, pure motor peripheral neuropathy, neuromuscular junction, and muscle level. Let's say there's muscle wasting plus intact sensation, then you know that neuromuscular junction like MG will not have muscle wasting. That's for sure. 
how many MG patients that you see muscle wasting actually no right they are always like a bit fatty and then a bit bulky like that so so you know that neuromuscular junction is not possible so if there's a muscle wasting together with normal sensation then you left with three possible localization which is anterior horn cell can be pure motor peripheral neuropathy and can be muscle okay that's how we localize the lesion so you must know this table is very important and i always give credit to my mentor prof tan who is actually uh taught us a lot last time and then helped us to build the foundation. So when you talk about peripheral neuropathy, just a quick one, You're, you want to classify the peripheral neuropathy to be predominantly motor or predominantly sensory and you want to give your different etiology like ARDP, CRDP, CMT, porphyria, LED or multifocal motor neuropathy. Sensory predominant you have a lot to mention but I generally like to classify it into a category so that I always feel easier to remember and also present. So it can be metabolic, common one, commons. So one can mention something like metabolic first, like diabetic diseases, uh, hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, CKD or uremia, drugs induced or toxin like alcohol, isonizide, cisplastin, neoplastic causes. Very easy to remember because neoplastic can be myeloma because of paraproteinemia or can be paraneoplastic. It's very easy to remember this way in terms of neoplastic cause of peripheral neuropathy. Inflammatory causes can be CIDB, CMT, vasculitis or chronic tissue disease. Infective can be HIV, leprosy or even Lyme's disease. And infiltrative can be amyloidosis or sarcoidosis. So if you kind of like uh, MDM, DM, uh, depending on what pneumonia you want to use, MMD, GER, III. So it's very easy for us to, to actually memorize this way and we present as this way. So the important thing is that when you offer etiology for peripheral neuropathy, you want to mention uh, whether it's sensory or motor predominant and what is the etiology of it, okay? So muscle, basically just proximal or distal, like I say, most of the myopathy is proximal. Generally classified into four different categories of myopathy. The common one is still dystrophic subtype. Can be inflammatory if there's a rash, like dermatomyositis. Endocrinal causes, usually they will have some endocrinal stigmata, like, you know, acromegaly, Cushing or thyroid. It can be metabolic, very rare, like mitochondrial disease, CPEO, glycogen storage disease, all these are rare. But uh, I think for neural examination, we should focus on the dystrophic first, which can be X-linked uh, myopathy like Duchenne or Becker, can be limb girdle, can be dystrophia myotonica, can be FSHD, or can be oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. So you can see that actually there's not much of differential diagnosis for myopathy. So, but generally if you classify as such, it's easy for you to present and remember as well, okay? For distal myopathy, definitely you can have dy dystrophia myotonica, inclusion body myositis, inherited distal myopathy like Miyoshi or Valander. All those are very rare, but these are the things that you may want to uh, offer as your differential. So next is actually how do you approach if let's say there is a bilateral lower limb weakness and also wasting. Like I mentioned, weakness, uh, I mean weak and waste, but the sensation for example is normal or even abnormal. So Remember that your inspection in neuro, like we mentioned in the previous session, you want to do your inspection properly. You want to mind your patient, mind the sign, okay? So mind is muscle wasting. You want to check for any wasting, predominantly symmetrical or asymmetrical, proximal or distal or both. And then you want to check for any involuntary movement like fasciculation or tremor. You want to check for any neurocutaneous stigmata like rash or like all the bruises. And then you want to check for any deformity, joint deformity, okay? or even like, for example, uh, and also the scar, muscle biopsy scar, nerve biopsy scar, or even uh, tendon transfer kind of scar at the different areas. And then you, you actually examine the usual way, tone power, reflex sensation and coordination. Then you proceed. Remember that our, our level should not stop at just coordination. This is medical student level. So that's why we need to proceed further because we want to know the etiology. When you talk about paraparesis, right, in this kind of case, you want to know is a spastic paraparesis or flaccid paraparesis. That's why your TPRCS should able to tell you which direction. If you let's say you're dealing with spastic paraparesis, like I say, you must check uh, further. You can either go from top to bottom or from the bottom to the top. So there's no right way or wrong way. Uh, I like to go from the from the bottom to the top sometimes, but sometimes I will choose the other way. It's very flexible how you do it. Because you, you want to check for any demyelination uh, in the case of spastic paraparesis. So you can check the eye for just very quick one, just check for the gaze, horizontal, vertical, and shine the torch right, check for any RPD. That will tell you any nystagmus, RPD, and, and INO together. Okay? Then you assess the speech, a quick one also, check for any tongue fasciculation and also the speech. Okay? And then you also quickly look at the upper limb. 
basically you want to check the reflexes we want to see whether there's any hyper reflexia whether there's an inverted supinated jerk this inverted supinated jerk you should able to elicit already if you're not checking the upper limb but let's say you you want to do a quick screening you can still check the reflex okay and the hoffman sign and then you want also want to check for sensory level and then you may also want to check for cerebellar sign as well because we know that cerebellar sign can have upper motor neural lesion as well so a quick one just a finger nose and this diagonal kinesia and then don't forget ever to check the neck and the back for any scar to suggest previous spinal instrumentation okay sometimes the scar can be anterior also so that's why the neck is important as well and then if you have time you can walk the patient and then you can end the examination by by offering you can check your anatone and neurogenic bladder in the case of spastic paraparesis okay this will be a complete kind of examination so for flaccid paraparesis like i mentioned just now already going through so i won't go through in detail but basically you can go from bottom to the top okay and then most of the time if everything is normal right so basically you're talking about can this be polymyositis or limb girdle muscular dystrophy okay but generally these are the approach that you should go through and then when patient have unsteadiness if patient have uh, a frequent fall or even uh, uh, unsteadiness in walking or fear of walking because of fall in the stem then the the, the scenario actually asks you to examine the neuro neurological examination then this is a scenario that actually is it should be our favorite because it's a very simple kind of approach so you just ask patient to walk and you look at whether patient is pyramidal or non or extra pyramidal kind of gait like i mentioned just now if it's a pyramidal you'll be spastic or hemiplegic kind of gait if it's a lower motor neuron it's maybe high stepping to suggest uh, like foot drop or lower motor neuron lesions uh, and it can be due to wandering gait to suggest myopathy and then extra pyramidal can be cerebellar gait can be parkinsonism gait or can be sensory ataxia gait okay but generally if you miss the let let let's say if you miss the spastic hemiplegic uh, or even balding or high stepping you, you don't have any issue because definitely you will still examine the lower limb but let's say if you examine the lower limb without examining the gait first you will definitely miss the cerebellar and parkinson uh, sign totally okay that's why it's important so how do we do the gait assessment definitely ask patient to stand and then put hands at the side to check for a rumble and then close the eyes and then ask patient to walk turn and then tandem okay so this is the standard approach when you want to check gait uh, you should check a full uh, full assessment of the gait in terms of these three steps and then before you check also you must ask you must ask the patient are you confident to walk if not i will stand by your side to make sure that you're okay so if the examiner say no need then you means that patient cannot walk lah. and then you must look for any clues like a wheelchair or a walking frame at the bedside it's all important okay but let's say patient cannot walk doesn't mean that you cannot check anything you can still ask patient to stand up and then do a rumble okay not necessary patient cannot walk then you just skip the whole gate assessment okay so then you examine the lower limb lower limb should be able to tell you uh, which direction you are heading uh, okay i won't go to in detail so foot drop is another i would say a difficult scenario if you never encounter but at the same time if you know the concept behind it it becomes easy so i i don't think i want to go through in detail as well the foot drop it was uh, already discussed in the last uh, session last time in the particularly in the neuro kind of approach but just bear in mind that foot drop you want to tell yourself whether you're dealing with unilateral foot drop or bilateral foot drop and if you talk about unilateral foot drop like i say just focus on the differential diagnosis first because that will help us to localize the lesion so if you go from the top to the bottom right it can be cortical cause of the foot drop unilateral foot drop which is the aca infarct which affect the lower limb more than upper limb at the contralateral side that's why unilateral foot drop it can be at the level of anterior horn cell in the case of polio okay polio can cause foot drop generally have wasting and atrophy as well it can be at the level of the root of the plexus particularly l5 radiculopathy because of for example local trauma or injury or space occupying lesion and then it can also be nerve level it can be sciatic nerve or common or deep peroneal nerve so how do you localize that actually it's very simple you just examine the lower limb like usual just that your hip you must check for abduction and then at the same time you must also check for your foot eversion okay and also the dorsiflexion definitely you will check dorsiflexion but foot eversion is also important so if you do this extra test basically you're already checking for all the thing okay and how to localize i won't go through in detail basically you can refer to the last recording how about bilateral foot drop so how do we approach bilateral foot drop is that you can still be cortex lesion for example parasagittal lesion at the cortex causing bilateral uh, foot drop 
<clears throat> and then it can also be a case of cerebral palsy and then how about anterior horn cell it can be a case of uh, motor neuron disease but predominantly uh, lower motor neuron lesion which is a case of for example progressive muscular atrophy or a mixture for example ALS okay generally if you're talking about primary lateral sclerosis PLS is predominantly upper motor neuron lesion no lower motor neuron lesion when you talk about mixing of upper and lower motor neuron lesion is a, in a motor neuron disease then this is ALS okay so if it's a root or plexus it can also mean L5 but to have a bilateral L5 uh, reticulopathy is very rare and it only found in cardiac equina I don't think patient is stable for, for exam so most of the time is it won't come out and then bilateral nerve can definitely so you're talking about peripheral neuropathy and you're talking about predominantly motor okay so that's why you get the ARDP, CRDP, CMT and also multifocal motor neuropathy okay it can also localize at the level of the muscle okay like inflammatory so for example inclusion body myositis those distal myopathy in particular that's why uh, inclusion body myositis is there dystrophic my, uh, myopathy for example uh, dystrophia myotonica FSHD and inherited distal myopathy so all these kind of possibility is in your differential diagnosis and how do you examine it is the same thing same thing as how you examine the foot drop like just now okay so tone power reflex sensation coordination you also want to check whether about for com as compared to unilateral foot drop that you want to check for the hip abduction and also the ankle eversion uh, the foot eversion the main thing about bilateral foot drop is usually uh, not local causes meaning it's not nerve so you want to check for uh, systemic causes as well so that's why you must also check the myopathic screening sensory test okay that will tell us more okay so I'll go to abdomen so if anyone have any question can just post in the chat box uh, during the discussion so abdomen is perhaps to me is always the easiest scenario however abdomen can have a lot of variation and a lot of people Having said that, although it's an easy scenario, a lot of people will still think abdomen is very tough because you fail to actually think of the possibility. Because actually there's various type of possibility in abdomen examination. But essentially, if you make it simple, it's not difficult. You just need to be creative a bit and think of the possibility. So these are some of the, uh, I would say, uh, tips in abdomen station. So you should screen for peripheral when you look at the patient, inspect at the end of the bed. You should ask patient to show you the hand okay in the supine position show me your hand like that and then you want to see whether there's any fistula or scar by doing so you're already screening for renal abdomen then it tells you that okay most likely you are dealing with renal cases okay let's say there's no fistula and you check for it when you stand at the right side of the at the bed it does not exclude renal abdomen that's why you still need to proceed further but it just tells you a clue when the patient has clubbing, stigmata or chronic liver disease, like a bit jaundice like that, then you know that, okay, maybe you're dealing with hemato or even uh, hepatobiary kind of cases, okay? Chronic liver disease does not always mean hepatobiary, it can also mean hemato. Like for example, thalassemia also can develop secondary hemosiderosis and causing cirrhosis as well. So, but it will tell you that it points to non-renal kind of station, okay? Next is, uh, look at the patient, whether the patient is anemic or jaundice. We should if patient is pale and also have tinge or jaundice, then you need to think hard of possibility of chronic hemorrhagic disease, commonness being thalassemia. Don't fix our mind that in chronic hemorrhagic disease, there's only thalassemia, although it's commonness. Always think that there's always things like hereditary spirocytosis, there's also things like sickle cell anemia, okay? So there's a lot of all these are common, uh, not so common, but uh, uh, can happen chronic hemorrhagic diseases that, that can present similarly. Okay, and then, and even chronic RTP also, okay. So you want to check for the mouth, always check for the dental hygiene and the tea mouth occlusion because dental hygiene and tea is important. Let's say you're dealing with case of thalassemia because extra medullary hemopoiesis, they will have a lot of tea mouth occlusion. And renal cases definitely want to look for the gum for any hypertrophy, okay. So let's say it's a renal abdomen, right, and there's a Rutherford Morrison scar st staring at you at the abdomen. Right? When I check the... When I check the mouth, oral cavity, I'll definitely ask patient to show him or her gum. So if I ask the patient to do, or you can do yourself, it's fine. Just that you do yourself, sometimes you can be very harsh in examiner point of view. If you ask patient to do, it's also better way. Okay, and then you want to look hard over the neck to look for any parathyroidectomy scar to suggest mineral bone disease, and then 
chest and axilla to actually suggest any stigmata or chronic liver disease okay and then uh, also uh, after that you want to check for the abdomen inspect palpate percuss pelot escaltate the reason why i put underlying escaltate is that trust me a lot of a lot of things a lot of times happen already very uh, whether it's in a mock exam or the real exam a lot of candidates examine the abdomen with the stethoscope hanging on the neck for an inspection until the end until presentation and walk out from the station wash with alcohol and everything and yet haven't used the stethoscope it's very easy to forget about auscultation in abdomen so tell yourself that when you after you palpate you do the percussion okay and then you look for shifting downers remember to bal uh, ballot the kidney and remember to put the stethoscope use the stethoscope remember your stethoscope is with your neck or else you will definitely forget even myself last time when i started i also forget i can easily forget during the practice so when I go for more or even go for the real exam, I always tell myself, okay, I will definitely use my stethoscope, okay, and then I will not forget. So in abdomen, my, my usual practice is that I will always have enough time, about one minute. So abdomen, usually by five minutes, you can complete the, you can already kind of like complete the examination for abdomen. So before you press the pedal edema, to me, is better way is actually to sit up the patient, to ask the patient to sit up for you. From the, from the lying flat position and then you start to examine the neck for any cervical limb node make it a routine to me it's important because if there's a cervical limb adenopathy it changed a lot of differential diagnosis okay and then after that the idea of actually asking patient to sit up is also to really look hard at the patient back a lot of times you'll be surprised that certain things can be missed for example nephrectomy scar bilateral or even single nephrectomy scar can only be visible when when you sit up the patient at the back because the scar sometimes can be very posterior lateral side you may not appeal to appreciate and second thing is that you may also want to see at the uh, lower lumbar region near the, uh, the 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 psis area whether there's any uh, evidence to suggest a bmat in, uh, scar also any puncture hole like that to suggest any bmat done okay and then you may also sometimes certain patients with cirrhosis their spider nearby somehow is just on the posterior back either upper or lower back sometimes anterior may not have much spinal knee why that's why you need to convince yourself which direction you're heading that's why it's also important and sometimes certain patients only have tattoo at the back so all these things is important oh okay so yeah someone need to mute it so that's why i feel it's still important for us to sit up the patient examine the lead node and examine the back only then you you press the leg for the pedal edema there's an important caveat here is that if you examine a thalassemia patient if it's a clear-cut thalassemia I think it's expected for us to actually listen to the heart as well. You should place the bed in the 45 degree and then you should actually escalate it just at the lower left sternal edge, particularly at the or probably at the upper and the lower uh, st left sternal edge, upper at the pulmonary area to look for any loud P2 and also lower sternal edge to listen for any pansystolic murmur which may suggest tricuspid regurgitation because this is one of the complications of the thalassemia that you can mention and then and then make your presentation even more meaningful okay then of course you can thank the patient and then end the examination okay so this is how we approach basically we know uh the abdomen usually it's just we know or non we know abdomen okay we know it's very easy i would say uh if you come out short case uh it's a renal case you must score full okay there's no reason why you should not score full after you listen to this uh, to this kind of sharing session because we know it's very straightforward Okay, the only thing that is not straightforward is the scar. That's why today we are going through as well. And then non-renal one, you are thinking about hepatobiliary or hemato. But particularly if you want to differentiate hemato or hepatobiliary is difficult clinically. What is the usual thing that comes is actually whether that is isolated hepatomegaly, isolated spinomegaly or hepato and spinomegaly. So you may have chronic liver disease, you may have chronic hemolytic diseases, you can have uh, hematological diseases like myelo or lymphoprovid diseases. And then also bear in mind that sometimes you get the atypical cases like ascites, no palpable liver, no palpable spleen as well, just like ascites, and then offer a differential diagnosis. You can have a different, uh, you can also have a transplant, liver transplant uh, patient that typically have a <coughs> typically have a chevron incision or the rooftop scar in a in that was in the olden days in the in the nowadays we we prefer to use the modified makuchi incision that will be something like uh, yeah it's like a, i don't know how to describe it but basically you all can google it 
okay and then it, you also can anticipate that some patient with stoma back can also come out in exam and that may actually point to you that are you dealing with a case of IBD so these are the kind of the cases that you need to expect as well and one of my, my I still remember my first attempt in in Johor Bahru that time the abdomen station was really mind blown I didn't expect <laughs> it's kind of like a station that that is unusual to me so it, I started with abdomen that time and then the finding that I got is a super pubic mass really there's no hepatobiotic uh, there's no stigmata or chronic liver disease or, or kidney disease there's also no uh, BMAT scar patient is not anemic not jaundice basically nothing but I feel something some mass at the bladder region super pubic region and so the discussion actually point to gynae malignancy pregnancy uh, bladder cancer or even uterine cancer things like that so it, it can happen in exam but the idea is don't panic just do the usual way I mean just like how we practice uh, in the real life not everything is textbook that's why we need to just go uh, with what we thinking of huh? so presentation for renal I still prefer to go through this because <clears throat> renal presentation is one of the presentation that I will I will still prefer to use template because if you confirm this is a renal case if you use template it will be more concise and shorter way to present okay so for example a patient that have a fistula over the left forearm is a rcf fistula and then got a thyroidectomy scar and then got a reverse uh, hostic, uh, hockey stick scar over the right side of the of the abdomen and then for example also looks a bit pale okay so how do you present it so i will just say that this patient has a has a working diagnosis of uh, end-stage kidney disease on kidney replacement therapy the active move of kidney replacement therapy would be uh, a functioning uh, left AV fistula with evidence of recent needling and audible breweries as well as the trill, bubble trill and uh, wait sorry I need to rewind a bit because when you encounter this patient before you learn before you decide what to present you need to tell yourself that with the renal transplant uh, scar there and with the fistula there you need to tell yourself that which one is the active mode of kidney replacement therapy so how do you differentiate is that so a lot of times we know that uh, if the kidney fails already then definitely patient need to go back to HD and most of the time your fistula will have a lot of needling lah. so by definition if you have a needling recent needling fistula then you know that the kidney transplant has failed however bear in mind that a lot of patients that have underwent HD first that, although, that only undergo transplant and then what happened is that their fistula is still functioning and they are, they are not actively dialyzing required dialysis to the fistula and because the kidney transplant is functioning so how do you differentiate this kind of patient the only way is actually to look at whether there's any needling site okay so to look for any recent needling site that's the only way because we know that in kidney transplant not all patients will, will have to ligate the native fistula there are certain criteria to decide whether the native fistula need to be ligated for example, in the case of uh, high dynamic circulation, what we call a steel, uh, steel phenomenon for the fistula, there's a high flow fistula that you need to ligate it or else you affect the hemodynamic, the heart function and subsequently the kidney transplant perfusion. Those are the cases that we may need to ligate it. But most of the time, if the patient uh, is well, the fistula is okay, usually we will, we will just give it, uh, leave it there and it's like a second resort let's say patient kidney transplant suddenly fail at least they got fistula to, to, to actually dialyze so the key is actually to differentiate which one is the active mode of kidney replacement therapy so let's say in my case I saw the recent needing then I already know that the kidney transplant failed already lah. okay so I will say that okay so the active mode of dialysis uh, the active mode of kidney replacement therapy will be a left functioning AV fistula with the recent needing the past mode of care, uh, kidney replacement therapy will be in my opinion will be the failed uh, right kidney transplant okay and however there's no breed uh, audible over the scar and then another thing is that uh, I also noticed that there's um, a scar over the necks to suggest a previous uh, internal jugular catheterization okay something like that let's say got midline midline lapatomy scar or transverse horizontal kind of scar that may suggest a previous tank cough uh, removal as well you can mention under the past mode so in terms of complication, I uh, think in terms of the uh, end stage kidney disease, uh, patient is not pale and there is no parathyroidectomy scar or evidence of deltoid or 
auto implantation scar to suggest mineral bone disease. Uh, otherwise, patient has no sign of uremia and clinically ill volumic and does not seem to have any fever. Let's say the infection is something important. Let's say patient is ongoing antibiotics. They want to mention that uh, patient may actually suffer from complication of infections. Okay, you might want to mention about that. Okay, and then complication in terms of immunosuppression in the case of transplant. You want to mention whether patient have any Cushingoid features, and then whether patient have any uh, gum hypertrophy, hypertrichosis that will suggest calcineurin uh, inhibitor use, which is the cyclosporin, or tremor alopecia in the case of uh, in the case of tacrolimus, and then whether there is skin lesion or whether there's a hepatospinal megaly to suggest a uh, lymphoproliferative disorder that can be mentioned as well but generally you you that is not the main focus but this is something that we will usually routinely how we screen through and then you may also want to mention additional finding to suggest things like for example nephrectomy scar or, or some ad other additional finding so cause of end-stage kidney disease so you must try to elicit what is the cause of end-stage kidney disease Let's say there's polycystic kidney disease and patient is not required kidney replacement therapy, you still can present, you still can change the template. I think the patient have a chronic kidney disease, otherwise uh, no evidence to suggest a kidney replacement therapy. In terms of complication of the kidney replacement, uh, in terms of complic uh, sorry, so by definition when you think that this is an adult onset polycystic kidney disease, at the point of tinosis, chronic kidney disease, secondary to adult polycystic kidney disease in view of the presence of bilateral palatable kidneys okay in terms of complication you can mention that uh, patient have uh, appears a bit pale that suggests a renal anemia otherwise no parathyroidectomy scar to suggest uh, to suggest mineral bone disease activity uh, don't have any signs to suggest uremia clinically is, uh, is ill volume and then uh, immunosuppression you can also skip because not on and then you also want the additional finding you want to mention association with adult onset polycystic kidney disease things like for example hepatomegaly or spinomegaly that will suggest a polycystic liver and you also want to check for whether there's any third nerve palsy that may suggest previous rupture of bari uh, rupture of the berry aneurysm okay and you may also want to suggest things like uh, you want to check for the heart to, lo to listen for any murmur something like that okay so for those kind of cases, it's straightforward. The causes is adult onset polycystic kidney disease. But let's say these are the patient at end stage, no obvious cause, and then therefore you should always uh, go by the uh, most probable diagnosis. Let's say you saw the bar and bigger lesion got a lot of uh, insulin injection scar sites or any lipodystrophy, then this gives you a clue that whether this is diabetic kidney disease that become end stage as a primary diagnosis. So you can mention, you can still mention like uh, can be commonest being diabetes. Uh, causing uh, diabetic nephropathy or can be hypertensive nephropathy and then followed by glomerular nephritis in particularly autoimmune condition like lupus nephritis can be adult onset polycystic kidney disease uh, drug induced causes uh, uh, autoimmune other autoimmune diseases or post venal causes so if you follow the prevalence in Malaysia also diabetes is about 53% in 2022 onwards the, the NRR registry Diabetes is still the commonest, 53%. Hypertension used to be 30%, now it actually came down to about 25%. GN is actually common, number 3, which is actually about uh, about 3 to 4%. ADPKD is actually only about 0.5% in Malaysia. And then drugs is actually slightly more common, which is uh, uh, about 1%. 1, 1, 1%. Postvenal is also about 1% like that. So if you go by that, you can always go by the prevalence uh, in terms of the etiology. Okay? So... I just want to highlight this slide because I think uh, we need to be a bit creative because sometimes patients may not just came with two palatable kidneys and this is what we usually expected. So yes, if you got palatable kidneys, is that the first caveat is actually you need to differentiate hepatospinal megaly with palatable kidneys. It's easy said than done because most of the time, the palatable kidney can be so huge that it displays the liver or even the liver and the, the kidney jantung together, you don't feel any obvious margin. So sometimes it can be very difficult to differentiate. Okay? But the idea is that you need to tell yourself whether this is hepatospinal megaly or palatable kidney. So how to differentiate that is that actually if the uh, polycystic kidney is so huge, right, you should able to feel it superficially. The moment you do a light uh, gentle palpation, superficial palpation, you should able to feel the mass. You know? A palatable kidney should be easier in my own me. This uh, maybe you don't you maybe you cannot quote me, but this is from my experience sharing is that to me, palatable kidney is always easier to to be felt 
in the superficial palpation than deep palpation. Because when we press a bit harder, sometimes we will we will not we will lose the, the feeling of the mass and you cannot feel the border clearly. But when you you press superficially you will really feel it easily. Huh? And that's also kind of the definition when you ballot, you push from the bottom to the upwards, you will actually feel it easier because it's actually very superficially. So that's why uh, this is one of the way to differentiate. Another way is definitely try to delete the margin, eh, whether you can get above or, or below it. Okay, this is the first pitfall. Second pitfall is that whenever there is a scar with a palatable kidney or there is a hepatomegaly, for example, in case you misunderstand it as a hepatomegaly, so you always suspect that can there can there be a nephrectomy, uh, whether it's anterior or posterior approach, and then whether there's any uh concomitant transplant scar that suggests patient already underwent transplant because of the end-stage kidney disease from the ADPKD. So that's a few possibility. And then ADPKD also remember to check for hepatosplenial megaly, like I mentioned just now. Also check for the eye, especially the extraocular muscle uh, the movement, and then check for the anemia and also for the cardiovascular. So you can see the ADPKD is that you can take an extra effort. So these are all like expected or I would say like an open exam. The moment you encounter this, you should do like this. So if you follow this kind of approach, you shouldn't be very confused. You will just optimize your time well. At the moment, if you practice enough, generally by five minutes, you can you can finish. Okay? It's just that sometimes you are stuck because you want to confirm your finding. You may want to press a bit more and then feel a bit more. So those are the ones that will, will, will actually take more time. But generally, if you if you do it slick and you do it smoothly, you, will, you should be able to finish on time. Huh? And then scar, if let's say, what kind of anticipated variation that can happen? So let's say patient has underwent bilateral nephrectomy. So, and there is a transplant. Obviously, there must be a transplant or else patient will undergone dialysis. So let's say patient don't have transplant scar only on PD or even on HD. Then with a bilateral nephrectomy scar, then you need to think of this few possibility. It can be ADPKD that was removed. can be one hip lean down, can be bilateral RCC. can also be due to recalcitrant UTI. All those stubborn UTI that cannot cannot uh, be treated medically, surgically, and therefore need to remove the whole kidney can be due to a very severe form of obstructive uropathy that the kidney become space occupying lesion cannot function already, or can be a case of like, resistant hypertension refractory to all the lines of medication that need to be removed. Okay, but these are the differential diagnosis you should offer. How about Rutherford Morrison scar? It basically just transplant uh, whether it's functioning or fail, depending on whether there's any assisting uh, kidney replacement therapy stigmata. Lah. So other possibility is midline or paramedial laparotomy. Think about Tankoff catheter removal. Think about open approach of nephrectomy. Can be just midline laparotomy like that. Okay. Another thing is that you also can think about simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant if let's say the patient have midline sternotomy but not happening in Malaysia. Lah. Because uh, SPK is available in Singapore, is available in UK definitely and some of the center in, in overseas but Malaysia is unfortunately is still not that level yet but let's say the patient have a Rodefort Morrison scar and patient have male or male have fistula but, and let's say patient also have a midline sternotomy scar you need to think you need to think oh sorry not the midline sternotomy scar and also the uh, paramedian laparotomy or midline laparotomy scar you need to think hard that this patient can this be due to simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant scar Patient may have a midline sternotomy scar, which may suggest that the patient underwent CABG. Or you are talking about a patient that maybe the patient has a uh, adult polycystic kidney disease that already removed both kidneys or one of the kidneys, and also have concomitant mitral valve prolapse that require mechanical mitral valve replacement. So these are the possibility. But let's say you you don't feel any adult onset polycystic kidney disease, you don't think that is the diagnosis, and there's no palatable kidneys. It's just a transplant scar with midline laparotomy. You need to think about simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant because most of the time they transplant the kidney outside, and another timing they will they will actually transplant the pancreas. So this is actually useful. They can treat the type one DM, which actually can actually replace the new pancreas at the same time replace the new kidney. And then what what does the midline sternotomy uh, scar means in this case? That will be suggestive of cardiovascular comorbidities. Okay. I saw a lot, of pe a lot of people putting in the chat, right? How do you feel for collapsing pulse? Okay, probably I will go back to that later, okay? So, I just want to continue with the palatable kidneys. So, we must have our list of differential when we get a unilateral or bilateral palatable kidneys. I won't go through in detail because I think everyone 
by this time should know what is the differential diagnosis okay and then this is kind of like a usual workout for uh, renal how do you diagnose how do you work out for etiology and what's the complication and the management in terms of the pharmacological non-pharmacological and also the definitive treatment so next is a uh, i will talk about uh, hepatobiliary so when we encounter hepatomegaly uh, spinomegaly or hepatospinomegaly we should actually uh, try to classify based on the etiology and we can always shuffle our our etiology to present based on the priority of your examination sign so this is how i actually prepare for myself usually so i will classify into like toxic or myto uh, mitotic infective inflammatory infiltrative vascular or, or others lah. basically i hardly will mention the others until we really no other possibility already as i mean prompt you until you mention all that only i will mention about that lah. usually i won't okay so usually toxic for example like alcoholic liver disease or even hcc metastasis in the case of mitotic disease lah. and then infected can be hepatitis abscess inflammatory basically it's just ah bbc psc infiltrative or metabolic can be fat can be iron or can be copper vascular usually can be like congestive hepatopathy constrictive pericarditis or bacteria or like uh, thrombosis lah. Portovian thrombosis. Others one like for example, uh, cryptogenic can also happen. Okay, so spinomegaly you can always also divide in a similar way, but you can see a spleen essentially is a lymphoid organ, secondary lymphoid organ. So you want to focus more on the hematological causes as well. So my topic you are talking about myeloperiphery disorder or lymphoperiphery disorder, and also chronic hematic anemia. Okay, in fact, if you can still mention about uh, things that we mentioned in the hepatitis. But essentially, you want to differentiate into bacteria, viral, or parasite. That can also be the possibility. Bacteria talking about malaria, myelidosis, brucellosis, i.e., viral can be a lot of virus, and parasitic can be the uncommon ones, uh, cystosomiasis and leishmaniasis. Inflammatory can be like Felty syndrome in the case of advanced case of rheumatoid arthritis, or can be SLE. Infiltrates metabolic can be iron and the copper. Usually, fat does not cause spinomegaly alone unless it's a portal hypertension. Uh. Okay, so uh, amyloidosis, yes, possible. Uh, vascular can be in a spinomegaly without hepatomegaly, then you may need to think of cirrhosis with portal hypertension causing spinomegaly, or it can also be due to splenic vein thrombosis. Okay, and then others, which is rare, like, like sarcoidosis or glycogen storage disorder. Then hepatospinomegaly, you can combine both. Essentially, what you want to mention first is depending on do you think the sign is more suggestive of chronic liver disease? or the sign is more suggestive of hematological disorder. If you think it's more suggestive of uh, uh, chronic liver disease, then you may want to present things like uh, hepatomegaly with portal hypertension, particularly in the case of possible alcoholic liver disease or hepatocellular carcinoma, okay? Or mitotic lesion of the liver, for example. And then uh, it can be minor periphery disorder or lymphoperiphery disorder in the case of hematological condition or hemolytic anemia. In fact, if similar way like how you, how you present for the uh, spinomegaly, inflammatory is the same, infiltrative metabolic is also the same, vascular is the only thing that I mentioned, uh, hepatomegaly with portal hypertension and others. Okay, so uh, hepatobiary generally you want to complete examination by 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 saying out all this. Uh. So I realized that a lot of people didn't 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 know what to mention by completing the examination, probably because not usually mentioned. So make a practice and habit that you want to mention that you want to mention the vital sign chart. Uh, perform a per-rectal examination, examine the hernia orifice and perineal examination, uh, take a UFAM and measure the bedside uh, sugar, and also some targeted examination. You may also want to include, like, want to take further history regarding the behavior and stuff. Lah. Okay. So presentation, generally, uh, inspection, peripheral examination, abdomen sign, and then you offer the diagnosis. Lah. So let's say it's chronic liver disease, you want to say out the positive stigmata sign of chronic liver disease, and what are the complications? Meaning you're talking about portal hypertension, whether there's any ascites, dilated abdominal vein, and spinomegaly, whether there's any evidence of decompensation, which include jaundice, hepatic asteresis, fluid overload, or bruising. Okay. Additional finding, those additional clues that will give you some stigmata, which is include tattoo, IVDU, needling marks. Okay. And you want to offer your etiology based on the table, um, based on the chart before. Lah, okay. So a special note on the transplant patient. Let's say this is an end-stage liver disease with a stigmata or chronic liver disease with or without hepatomegaly, 
So you want to say that this is a post liver transplant evidenced by the roof flop scar or, or modified Makuchi incision scar, uh, complicated, or, or you want to say that otherwise no evidence of uh, complication in terms of portal hypertension, there's no ascites, dilated veins or spinal megaly, there's also no signs of decompensation like jaundice, free overload, asteresis or coagulopathy. And then there's also, uh, in terms of immunosuppression, uh, patient is not cushing noid, for example, or there's no gum hypertrophy. Additional finding, for example, patient may or may not have some scar to suggest uh, for other reasons. For example, depending on the etiology, like let's say patient have a stoma back and with this uh, Makuchi incision or the rooftop scar, with, with or without stigmata or chronic liver disease, you want to offer etiology to be possible due to IBD, in particularly that associate more that can be so-called cure from the colectomy is actually your you see ulcerative colitis because ulcerative colitis if you do pen colectomy so you can actually cure the disease because it does not involve the ileum most of the time unless you're talking about backwash elitis in the case usually not so then you're talking about why patient require liver transplant then the liver must have failed what's the reason what's the association with that so it's a PSC la, primary sclerosing cholangitis in association with ulcerative colitis that actually caused the liver to fail in the past okay so that may be the etiology that you want to mention okay so i won't go through this in detail but basically this is just like how you approach to i like to divide investigation in this way instead of saying i want to take fbc to look for any anemia uh, kidney function to look for any hepatovenous uh, involvement i want to look for liver function to check the synthetic function of the liver you can do that but if you are the examiner and everyone has mentioned this like times 10 examiner will definitely be bought I mean, of course, you say some, something standard uh, is actually not wrong, but I would actually advise everyone to do it differently. Make your own style. This is my style, but definitely I'm not expecting everyone to follow my style. Everyone have own style. You, 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 you can just develop your own style and present in a way that make it fresh to listen and make it attentive. And then it actually make you easy also in a way. So I would say that in terms of investigation, I will confirm my diagnosis and, so, and also stage the severity by uh, checking your liver function and coagulation profile as well as correlate clinically to calculate for the child's build score. I will also order the ultrasound abdomen to look for evidence of cirrhosis and ascites. I will do a diagnostic and therapeutic parental tapping. Let's say patient have ascites as well to look for serum SAAG, uh, not, not, not serum SAAG, just a SAAG, UFAM, uh, cultures and, and stuff. Lah. And, and in terms of non-invasive tests to check for cirrhosis, I can actually calculate FIT4 a pre score or even subject patient to fibro scan. In terms of etiology, I will take a hepatitis screening. I will take a alpha fetoprotein and, and also multi-phase CT scan, can be five-phase or four-phase, to, to screen for malignancy of the, of the liver. And then take a cultures, serology, and also look for, uh, for example, GGT as well, to look for whether possibility of alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune screening to look for autoimmune liver disease, iron storage, copper, as well as the fat, okay, and then, and if the diagnosis is uncertain, you can mention echo also if you think this is a uh, congested hepatopathy. If the diagnosis is uncertain, I may want to counsel and subject the patient for liver biopsy. Okay, but for hematological condition, you may want to add on whether you want to uh, include the PBF, BMAT, and also the lymph node biopsy. La. And then complication, you can mention things like CT brain or serum ammonia, varicell bleed, uh, screening, you want to do an OGDS band bending if needed. And then with the patient with ascites, you want to exclude whether there's any spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Patient with AKI, you want to include whether there's any hepatorenal involvement by checking this. Lah. So non pharmaco you can mention those. Pharmaco, you can mention this. Surgical. Yeah, generally, all these are like, everyone knows how to how to manage. It's just that how do you put it in words when you present it nicely. So this is how I will present. I will not expect everyone to just like go through this template 100%. You can modify a way that you may, maybe you mentioned two or three at each domain is definitely more than enough for one minute of investigation, one to two minutes, okay? So presentation for thalassemia is just, uh, I would actually um, not recommend anyone to follow this template unless you're confident and you are you are very sure that this is a thalassemia. Uh, because uh, ultimately, if you're not sure of the diagnosis, it's it always good to go back to the way we present on inspection, patient is like this, on peripheral examination, on abdomen examination, what are the signs? And then in summary, I think this patient have what you can mention like that. But if you think this is thalassemia, you can use this kind of template in a professional way, but there's no right or wrong. For thalassemia template, you can actually present more, definitely. But if you use the, the old school way, it's not wrong because you can also present additionally 
it just depends on how you present there's no right or wrong way to do that so let's say i want to do it in a different way like this i will say i think my working diagnosis for this patient is thalassemia as evidenced by the thalassemic phases uh with the uh clinically anemia con with congenital pallor and also tinge of jaundice uh, in terms of complication of thalassemia, for extra medullary hemopoiesis, I noticed that he, he or she has hepatosmegaly, frontal bosing, and also mala prominence. Uh, this patient also shows evidence of hypertransfusion, in which there is a slate gray pigmentation over the skin, and I noticed that there is a sugar finger prick mark to suggest patient may, may have a, or even insulin injection site to suggest patient may have a bronze diabetes. Um, I also noticed that patient have a loss of axillary hair, and that may suggest the clue that patient may have a hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. And there's also some stigmata or chronic liver disease to suggest secondary hemochromatosis. In terms of cardiovascular as a, uh, finding, I noticed that there is a primary hypertension or tricuspid vigor, which may suggest association with the uh, thalassemia. And then in terms of the joint, uh, I noticed that may have some atrophy to suggest that. In my short case, in my real exam abdomen, what I got is actually thalassemia, but it's not a very clear-cut thalassemia. It's a middle-aged man without very obvious kind of thalassemic faces. And the thing that struck me is the hand. The hand is like like gout, but pretty much I'm not gout because gout is like tophi. This one is not tophi. This one is just like, you know, um, it's not very bone. It's very bony and it's actually less chalky and, and bumpy like that. It's just like bony prominence here and there. And then I was like, is this RA? How can RA come up with abdomen? I'm like... But I, I present this as possibility of uh, pseudo gout or gout because after I examine the patient, I notice that the patient has thin shunjon disc and there's a pallor. And when I feel the abdomen, there's a hepatospinal megaly. And when I see the sacral region, I don't find any BMAX scar. And basically, I, I didn't examine the heart because I was very curious about the hand. And eventually, I present this patient as a thalassemia, hemo chronic hemorrhagic diseases and commonly being thalassemia. And the examiner actually asked me, so what do you think about the hand? Any association? And with that, I actually mentioned about can be possibility of pseudo gout because of the arthropathy. Huh? So you can see that how this template is, is complete in a way that it actually screens through all the clinical signs in thalassemia. And then following after, in terms of complication of chelation, most of the time patient is on oral chelation, not, not on saccade uh, desfoxamine injection. But let's say certain patient, they may put the saccade infusion pump at the bedside and bear in mind that this is not insulin pump or this is not uh, some, some infusion. So bear in mind that these are the defsoxygen infusion pump. Okay, so you may also want to comment that whether patient have any evidence of chronic hemolysis. If patient is on chemopore, PICC or frequent venular marks, then you know that patient has transfusion dependence. If patient have cholecystectomy scar or spinectomy scar, there's also suggest of chronic hemolysis, uh, hyperspinism, okay? So this will be like a general way of how we approach thalassemia and you can present as such as well. So investigation and management, I think nothing much. The important thing you want to highlight in your examination for, sorry, your investigation is to confirm diagnosis of the thalassemia, HD erythrophoresis or DNA analysis, full picture. And the complication, you must mention MRI T2 star. Okay, that's the most important thing. Of course, you need to mention about other complications like hypogonadism, pituitary screening, metabolic screening, osteoporosis screening, hepatitis screening because of the regular transfusion. Okay, all these like come like synapse like that within seconds. So, and the management is just uh, chelation, transfusion, and surgery and transplant in let's say it's a candidate. And then, Okay, just like that. So lymphoprobability or myeloprobability disorder sometimes uh, it's a bit rare, but it can come out like, for example, myelofibrosis because they got a very huge spleen. Sometimes the spleen can be removed also, but they may or may not have hepatomegaly. So sometimes when the patient came just like a splenectomy scar, then you need to think that what are the etiology of the splenectomy scar. So don't, don't be surprised when you see the patient splenectomy scar, but there's no palpable liver or if there's a palpable liver. So it can be some form of uh, can be some form of thalassemia, but usually thalassemia will have hepatomegaly. It can also be myelofibrosis because myelofibrosis may or may not have hepatomegaly. So you need to have a few differential in your mind. So let's say just isolated spinectomy scar and there's no other scar already. So what are the possible etiology? Okay. So you may also think about things like splenic trauma, splenic uh, abscess that require removal surgery. So these are the things that you need to go by your usual thinking instead of i mean as in not the usual thinking think out of the box what are the common thing that can happen and then what are the possibility and how it correlates with your usual differential okay so let's say it's a lymphoma or myeloproliferative disease 
You want to comment about the anemia, hepatospina megali, and limb adenopathy if probable. And then you also want to mention that there's no stigmata of chronic liver or kidney disease. And then the complication, for example, is a is a cancer patient. You want to mention things like, I, I think this all these are not common, but this is something that you want to be aware whether there's any side effect from chemotherapy, hypoviscosity, and also any line infections, and also whether there's any chemoport or PSCC inside too. So myeloproliferative, like a benign kind of thing, is like a polycythemia, uh, essential polycythemia, essential thrombocytosis, uh, CML or MF. And then lymphoproliferative can be lymphoma or leukemia, okay? Just like that. So investigation, nothing much. Basically, you just want to PBF, FBC, BMAT, for three reasons, you want to look for cytogenetics, for chromosomal typing, immunophenotyping for type cell type differentiation, and molecular study for pronostication. Okay, and then lymph biopsy, CT scan, PET scan, and then complication wise, these are actually very rare to be honest. But these are the things that you also need to be prepared. Sometimes they will ask you things like CML or what are the management of CML things like that. So you you can mention the essential point. CML supportive. Other than that. TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and also for the field alpha positive, and they consider transplant. You can mention about this. And then polycythemia viral essential thrombocytosis is actually just to, uh, depending on the risk, if it's a low risk alone, aspirin plus when a section, uh, PRN. And if it's a high risk patient, you need to cyto reduce, uh, cyto reductive therapy. Okay. And then myo fibrosis, you can consider the cyto reductive therapy as well, or even transplant. So these are all the possibilities. Uh. Okay, so I think other differential diagnosis that I already mentioned, SITs, they will, they will test you on the causes and the exudative, transudative causes. What are the other usual, unusual scar that like I mentioned? Reverse transplant can come out, or even some hepatectomy, BRE procedure. So this modified Makuchi as well as a rooftop scar can, can actually suggest all this. Okay, and then when liver transplant patient, you want to talk about etiology, you want to think about can this be in, in, in Western country, like, like for example, UK, you uh, I mean the commonest cause etiology of a liver transplant is still PCM uh, uh. We know that the King's College criteria actually derived from UK, right? So that is the criteria to decide whether want to transplant the patient with the acetamorphin poisoning. Okay, so it's common is still like drug or toxic acquired, and then followed by hepatitis or HCC. And then HCC, what is the transplant criteria? It's a Milan criteria, or now it's actually becoming modified Milan criteria. Okay, something like one two three five kind of thing. So congenital, uh, you're talking about BAV atresia, post uh surgery. So you can also talk about allergy syndrome in a congenital cause. So usually these are the etiology in a way for a patient to have an end-stage kidney disease that require transplant. And then hepatectomy or biliary procedure can also occur with the same scar. So superbibic mass, like I mentioned, I just mentioned because I couldn't before. But I know that it's not common, definitely. So these are all the possibility. And ileal mass, you want to think about TB, uh, you want to think about abscess, tumor. Okay, you also want to think about uh, some other unusual uh, collections. Okay, so these are very unusual. But these are the things that you need to you need to expect the unexpected one. Okay, so in summary, I think everyone the idea of for 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 tonight's session is to practice and practice. You must make sure that someone is with you when you practice, so that you they can elaborate you and we and you can be correct each other, and you also need to have a friend around you so that you can present properly like you are in exam because a lot of time when you practice in hospital right you just touch 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 examine and then just go off like that you're not practicing to me a, f a real practice is a practice that mimics the exam 100 percent meaning to say from the you know, time you from the from the point of time that the case was found by someone with a good sign was calibrated and then you are giving uh five minutes uh with one minutes of alert Reminder and then you are going through the four minutes of viva and then that is a full kind of practice So don't actually practice just practicing as in just try to appreciate the sign and then not presenting The better way to practice is actually getting the sign correct and also practicing To talk and present okay, and then mind map of the common cases like what we do and then you should actually with enough practice and also some of this knowledge you should able to actually uh Aim for perfection for each station. There's no reason why you cannot score the station. If you have practice enough and you anticipate all the possibility and your sign is very solid, you can you can be confident with your sign, you should be able to aim for perfection. Okay? And then you also need to expect an unexpected one sometimes. And sometimes I think in the exam the most important thing is don't create sign and also be honest. 
you have to admit our own limitation. If you forgot to mention that, you say, yeah, sorry, I forgot to do that. But giving enough time, I will definitely do that or something like that. Lah, something. And then definitely before the exam, you must rest well and pray for the best. Lah, okay. This is how we will end the session. But before that, I just want to answer. Uh, oh, there's no slide, is it? Oh my God, sorry for that. Huh? So the slide was off. Uh. Let me resume presenting. Yeah, can you all see me? Okay, so sorry for that. Uh, yeah, don't know when was the slide hilang already. <laughs> so 13 minutes ago. So you all didn't able to see the slide, correct? So yeah, some uh, yeah someone accidentally click present and then the slide are uh, minimized. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So but but don't worry. Uh, I will provide a recording later. You all can look back later because the my recording should have the slide lah. Okay. So I just want just want to know anyone have any question. Uh. Someone asked about how do you feel for collapsing pulse. So it's a bit unfair for me to answer this question because this should be done at the bedside. Lah. I cannot teach you things uh, virtually, right? Because this essentially is a bedside examination. But what I can tell you is that you feel for your pulse first. You can imagine that you are actually feeling your pulse with your left hand over your uh, over over the patient uh, left uh, over the patient right hand for the pulse. So you are feeling for both pulse first. Usually we do, we must feel for both pulse, especially for cardio, on the route for radial, radial delay. So you feel both hand with both pulse. Then after that, you let go your left hand because you're no longer feel, sorry, you let go your right hand because you're no longer feeling your uh, patient's uh, left hand pulse. And then basically you are actually feeling the uh, patient right hand pulse with your left hand, okay? So you try to time the pulse, uh, just give you, give yourself a good six or ten second just to time it whether it's a regular and how is the how is the uh, uh, volume of it okay then if it's a regular good volume then yes and and, and, and try to characteristic uh, try to characterize it because if your volume is so little then you won't expect the crossing pulse to be positive uh. crossing pulse must be positive if it's bounding or it's like very uh, very good kind of pulse volume uh. okay so next thing you do is actually you hold the wrist, the patient wrist with your right hand and then you put your left hand actually at the elbow and then you tell the patient whether you have any pain before you lift up the hand. So when you lift up the hand, the important thing to actually to actually do is actually be, right before you lift out your hand, uh, sorry, right before you lift out the patient right arm, you must actually let go a bit of your right uh, hand until you cannot feel the pulse because when you lift up, when you suddenly can feel the pulse, then this is collapsing pulse positive. At the same time, your left hand should able to feel the pulse more prominent as well because you are lifting up the, the hand. Because if it's so hyperdynamic circulation, collapsing pulse will definitely be positive. So the next question is, is collapsing pulse positive is a definite sign of aortic regurg? The answer is actually yes and no. So if you have crossing pulse and other signs like for example early diastolic murmur, that will suggest, or even like corrigan sign, that will clear cut suggest aortic regurgitation. Okay? But sometimes you will realize that a patient with hyperdynamic circulation, for example, a patient with severe mitral regurgitation, patient with mitral valve prolapse, patient in pregnancy, patient with hemodynamic, uh, hyperdynamic circulation, like in the case of patient with inotropic support. So when you, when you do that collapsing pulse routinely and in a clinical setting, you realize that a lot of patients actually have collapsing pulse also. So, but it is not very specific. But in our short case exam, it is specific to mean that this is actually aortic regurg. But bear in mind that in mitral severe MR and, uh, and MVP, both of them can also have positive collapsing pulse as well. Okay? So, hope you answered the question. What is the difference between perimeter and extra perimeter barbar palsy? Will this slide and video available later? Yeah, so I believe that when you ask, it, ask me this question, it means that you haven't seen the last recording, right? The neuro kind of uh, session. Because I purposely don't want to make it very lengthy session. I limit myself 10, uh, 2 hours and with that already exceeded another 10 minutes. So the, the reason why I don't want to go through uh, barbar palsy is because uh, there's, there's a lot of theory behind. But the thing is that in the exam, usually they will not come up with a Baba Bausi alone. Usually it's associated with other things, for example, like Parkinson, for example, like cerebellum, or for example, uh, in the case of, uh, for example, in the case of uh, uh, 
lateral Wallenberg syndrome or in the case of uh, other condition lah. basically like even stroke also stroke also can come out as a short case though like hemiplegia hemiparesis like that yeah so the, the, the thing is that uh, we don't routinely assess the assess the speech but our surrogate sign is always the swallowing that's why um, but we don't we don't check for gag at all but what we do is we see whether patient on any rice tube feeding or not so this is another clue to suggest baba palsy as well okay so another clue is that if the patient is on tracheal tube as well that will actually tell you that maybe patient have a stormy emission previously and then patient may also be on rice tube and that will tell you that patient may have already some palsy lah. most likely it's actually baba palsy which is a, actually a lower motor neuron kind of palsy huh? because of the injury nerve but again all these things are not very important in exam to me for the baba palsy uh, extra pyramidal and pyramidal is basically essentially mean if anything is outside the the pyramidal what is mean by pyramidal is actually from the motor fiber in the motor cortex until the nerve okay so if it's out, not outside it basically means either it's parkinson in the basal ganglia or it's in the cerebellum nah. so anything inside is actually from cortex all the way to the nerve nah. okay so these are the pyramidal so yeah any other question yeah, another thing I want to promote is that for those that uh, just join uh, this group or, or still preparing for exam, uh, since if you have if you all still have time, you actually can consider to get a copy of my revision notes, which essentially inside will have a lot of uh, all my notes uh, basically, and then uh, all the slide actually is also provided as well in in one of the QR link inside the book. So, but my book is not only focusing about the short case; it's also more on the approach in the clinical consultation uh, scenario. So. Those that have purchased before, you realize that a lot of times, paces follows a certain limit of curriculum. So if you practice all the STEM, all the approach in my book, right? Basically, you can actually handle most of, more than 90% of the scenario because most of the time, like for example, approach to headache, approach to uh, diarrhea, acute diarrhea or chronic diarrhea, approach to brain vision. So all these are actually expected kind of scenario that will come out in, in the clinical consultation scenario. So that's why if you all... Uh, uh, if you all think if you all think you want this kind of approach, you can actually get a copy, and then you can see what are the differential diagnosis, what are the question you need to ask, and how do you investigate. Management is actually depending on ideology. So certain things like in my book, I will only mention about a certain diagnosis and a certain management. But bear in mind that the important thing is how do you get the diagnosis. For example, how do you approach? I will give you an example. For example, the um okay. Another thing to know is actually uh, nowadays when we came up with the exam scenario, we should not give a very vague kind of presentation or stem. Last time in the exam, they can give a very vague stem. For example, this patient presented with weight loss for three months. Please uh, take a relevant history, examine the patient and explain to the patient something like that. But the chief complaint is weight loss. So you see that if the chief complaint is weight loss, it's actually very vague. Uh, but there is still approach to that. I mean, we, 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 we also have our approach to how to target this weight loss, okay, for example. But again, uh, you, you, you all shouldn't be worried because nowadays, the, the new format has already been, uh, I would say, standardized that uh, we shouldn't come up with so uh, non-specific kind of chief complaint. Chief complaint should be very obvious kind of chief complaint, like dysphagia, difficulty to swallow, things like that, for example. Okay, so a lot of things uh, you need to know how to approach it and the only way to know is actually you learn from other people uh, to know how to know how to uh, approach in every different scenario. It's actually not difficult. Huh? You just need to practice and and knowing uh, how is how is the way that you can get the positive history uh, in a quick way and a systematic way. You should also consider to join because I, 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 I cannot commit with all these online teachings but we have a lot of teaching around. So for example, we do have mock in the next coming Tengganu. Tengganu is very good mock. Whoever that haven't been to Tengganu mock, you all can consider investing 2000 plus when you get into that because they actually give you a chance to become an active candidate and also become an observer at the same time also teaching session and practice session. So they clamp everything into two days and everyone general feedback after coming back from Tengganu is cerebral edema. Everyone is just too tired to examine patient for next one or two days. It's, it's very intense uh, I feel but it's very good so those that can those that uh, feel like your your clinical exposure and the short care exposure is not good probably you can consider to join the mock and I would actually agree that uh, we should probably join one or two mock before you go for the real exam in order for you to really can imagine what is the exam like I didn't join my I didn't join any mock before my first attempt 
I failed by one mark in one of the component, but I think that one mark actually uh, give me a lot of, uh, teach me a lot of things. Firstly, it teach me that actually we, we actually a lot of things can be better, huh? Because even practically speaking, even if you pass with just one mark margin, right, you'll be happy, but you know that this is not your best. A lot of times we know that when we practice enough, when we, when we have studied, not so much of study, basically just practice. When you have practiced really enough, you, you should be able to perform well, okay? So that's the reason why we should not aim for borderline pass. We should aim for excellent. And aim for, aiming for excellent is not difficult for basis exam. Trust me, a lot of people get a very high marks, really, really high marks kind of score. So, so I, would, I would say that you should not be worried that you will fail. You should be thinking that how to make yourself even better. Huh? This is how the mentality should be. And I really hope all the best to everyone that is going for the uh, diet in December. Okay? If there's no question, I will just end the session. Nah? Alright? Okay?